Well, um, good evening, members, and a warm welcome to you, and also to officers and any members of the public who may be viewing the live stream this evening. Uh, welcome to this meeting of South Cambridgeshire District Council Scrutiny and Overview Committee. My name is Councillor Grenville Chamberlain, and I am the chair of this committee. Um, to any member of the public watching, you may um, see just a few of us in the council chamber. Um, that is, as we are following the advice of the Director of Public Health and keeping our exposure to a, a minimum, but I'm delighted that the rest of our colleagues and officers are joining online, and I'm grateful to you all uh, for looking after each other's health. May I remind those present in the council chamber that everything on your desk, including your laptop screen, may be broadcast at some point. The camera will follow the microphone being switched on, so councillors and officers are requested to wait a couple of seconds before speaking to allow the camera to catch up. And if the fire alarm sounds, then please leave the chamber by the door near the top table and make your way down the stairs. Do not use the lift. The safe assembly point is next to the marketing suite, halfway along the business park. And if I may address those joining us via the live stream, uh, please indicate that you wish to speak, speak via the chat column. Please do not use the chat column for any other purpose. Please make sure that your device is fully charged and that you switch, you switch your microphone off unless you are invited to do otherwise. And please ensure that you've switched off or silenced any other devices you have so that they do not interrupt proceedings. Please use a headset if available when speaking and hold the microphone close to your mouth. When you are invited to address the meeting, please make sure your microphone is switched on and when you finish addressing the meeting, please turn off your microphone immediately. Please speak clearly and slowly, and please do not talk over or interrupt anyone. And please note that if we do need to vote on any item, we shall do so via the microphones, but only those present in the chamber can vote or propose or second any recommendations. Uh, committee members present in the chamber I will now invite each of you to introduce yourselves. Members, after I call your name, please turn on your camera and microphone. Wait two seconds and say your name so that your presence may be noted. As I said earlier, my name is Councillor Grenville Chamberlain and I am the member for Hardwick Ward. Uh, my well, Vice Chair is, is Councillor Judith Griffith, Griffith, Griffith and I shall now ask her to introduce, introduce herself. herself. Good evening. I'm Councillor Judy Rickers. Use the mics rather than the mm -hmm. speech, please. And then if you need the time. Thank you. Um, good evening, Councillor Judy Rickers, member for Milton Water Beach Ward and Vice Chair of this committee. Thank you, Judith. Uh, I now have call upon Councillor Anna Bradnam to introduce herself, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm Councillor Anna Bradnam, and I'm District Councillor for uh, one of the three District Councillors for Milton and Water Beach. Very much. And now, no. Councillor Dr Claire Daunton, please. It's OK. Um, sorry for the delay, Chair. Um, I'm Claire Daunton, and I'm one of the members for the Fenditon and Fulbourne Ward. Thank you very much. And Councillor Dr Richard Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. I'm Richard Williams. I'm the member for the Whittlesford Ward. Thank you, Richard. Uh, uh, joining us virtually, we have Councillor Henry Batchelor. Evening, Chair, Councillor Henry Batchelor, one of the members for the Linton Ward. Thank you, Henry. And Councillor Paul Bearpark, please. We can't hear you, Paul.
Can you please confirm your presence, Councillor Paul Bear Park? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Oh, great. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, my name is Paul Bear Park. I'm also a member representing Milton and Water Beach. Thank you very much. Uh, we now come to Councillor Dr. Martin Kahn. Uh, hello, uh, Martin Kahn, uh, Councillor for one of the councillors for Histon and Impington and Orchard Park Ward. Thank you, Martin. Councillor Nigel Cathcart. Uh, good evening, uh, Nigel Cathcart, and a member for Bassingford and Lipping Ward. Thank you, Councillor Peter Fain. Good evening, Peter Fain, Shelford Ward. Councillor Aidan Van der Weyer. Uh, good evening, yes, um, uh, I'm Aidan Van der Weyer from Barrington Ward. And Councillor Graham Cohn. Uh, thanks very much. I'm one of the councillors for Fenditton and Fulbourn Ward. Thank you. And um, I'm delighted to we, we have with us from the Cabinet, Councillor Tumi Hawkins. Good evening, Chairman. Good evening, Members. Uh, Tumi Hawkins, Member for Caldicott Ward and the Lead Cabinet Member for Planning, Policy and Delivery. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe we also have Councillor John Batchelor. We have indeed, Chair. Uh, John Batchelor, one of the members for Linton Ward, and I'm, I'm the lead member on the Cabinet for Housing. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor John Williams. Uh, good evening, Chair. I'm uh, John Williams. I'm uh, one of the members for Fenditton and Fulbourn Ward, and I'm also the lead Cabinet member for Finance. Thank you very much. And we have Councillor Bill Handley. Hello, uh, Bill Handley. I'm one of the members for Over and Willingham, and I'm the lead cabinet member for um, Community Resilience, Health and Wellbeing. Thank you, Bill. Um, may I ask, are there any councillors that I have missed? Uh, Chair, you've, uh, you've got oh. here the uh, uh, deputy leader and uh, uh, member for the Cotman Ward. My apologies, Councillor Goff, you're in the corner. <laughs> um, we also have a number of officers with us this evening. Um, we have Liz Watts, our Chief Executive, Stephen Kelly, Peter Maddock, um, Peter Campbell, Julie Fletcher from Housing, Caroline Hunt, Terry D'Souza and Matt Patterson. Uh, and I'm delighted to confirm that the meeting, this meeting is quorate. May I ask members if anyone leaves the meeting at any time, would they please make that fact known to me so that it can be recorded in the minutes? Um, before we proceed with today's agenda, I would just like to inform members about a letter which the Chair of the Audit and Corporate Governance Committee and I have sent to Mr. Daniel Fulton of the Fuse Lane Consortium. The last Audit and Corporate Governance Committee, Mr Fulton, had asked a supplementary question relating to the robustness of this Council's risk management of 3C ICT. Mr Fulton was under the impression that the head of 3C ICT also undertook duties at Cambridgeshire County Council and the combined authority. Our letter to him was to assure him that this was not the case and that the interim head of 3C ICT appointed 12 months ago worked for no other organisation. So, ladies and gentlemen, we now uh, re revert to the agenda. And I, as set on item two, is the apologies for absence. Uh, and can I ask uh, Ian Senior whether there are any apologies for absence, please? Thank you, Chair. Uh, four apologies from committee members. Uh, Councillors John Johnson, Hart, Hunt and Harvey. Also apologies from Leader of the Council, Bridget Smith. And um, we have two apologies today, uh, two, two substitutes for the committee today, Councillor Hedry Batchelor and Councillor Bear Park. Thank you very Thank much. You. 
Mr. Senior. Uh, item three on the agenda is declarations of interest. Uh, may I ask whether any members have interests to declare in relation to any item of business on this agenda? Um, if, an, if an interest subsequently becomes apparent later in the meeting, please would you raise it at that point? Councillor Bradnam. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I am three flavours of councillor for the area affected by item six. So I'm parish councillor, district councillor and county councillor um, in the area affected by item six. So Thank you very much. Councillor Rippers. Just to say that I'm district councillor, one of the local members, um, in relation to agenda item six, two. Thank you. Uh, councillor Peter Fain, you have your hand up. Thank you, Chair. Just to say that I'm a, a board member of Ermine Street Housing and also of Shower Homes, which may be relevant to item seven. Thank you very much. Um, I personally will uh, declare an interest as the sole director of Cecil Instruments, which owns commercial property adjacent to Milton Country Park and very close to the North East Cambridge Area Action Plan, which we will be talking about on item six. And can you just make sure who's chatting? Yes. Um, May I remind uh, members remote, uh, joining remotely, please use the chat solely for um, confirming that you wish to speak. Uh, Councillor Bearpark, did I see your hand up? Um, yes, you did. It's just regarding item six. Um, I'm district councillor for uh, Milton and Water Beach. Thank you very much. But any other direction, uh, declarations of interest? No. No. Thank you very much indeed. In that case, can we yes, move on? Yes, uh, I have my hand up. <laughs> oh, sorry, Martin. My apologies. Um, I can see it now. Yeah. I, I, I am a councillor for Histon in Peter and Orchard Park, and a tiny part of the uh, area affected by uh, uh, item six is affected, uh, uh, is in uh, my, my ward. Thank you very much indeed. So at that point, sorry, Councillor Bradman. Could we just ask for the volume in the room to be slightly higher, please? Yeah, of course you can. Not wildly, just slightly. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Yeah. Item four on the agenda is the minutes of the meeting held on Thursday, the 11th of November. Uh, I'll go through them page by page for accuracy, first of all. Page one. Page two. Page three, page four, page five, and page six. Can I ask uh, members, is everyone content with those minutes? And may I, at some point, sign them off as a true record of the, of the last meeting? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you all very much indeed. Um, item five is uh, public questions, and we have... Uh, in front of us this evening, an agenda which runs to almost 450 pages, potentially leading to a very long meeting. Um, so at the start of each meeting, we are allowing 15 minutes, up to 15 minutes for questions from the public. But as some of these questions are extremely long, and it's likely to take up most of that with the uh, asking of questions, uh, I will not be allowing um, follow-up questions this evening. Uh, but the first question comes from Mrs. Margaret Starkey. And Mrs. Starkey, may I invite you to ask your question, please? Please. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, the, this is in relation to item six on your agenda. The Area Action Plan for North East Cambridge is predicated on the proposed relocation of Cambridge Wastewater Treatment Plant, for which the de uh, Development Consent Order um, is still in the pre-application stage. 
Given that the DCO application is unlikely to be submitted until late 2022 or early 23, the proposed Regulation 19 submission of the Area Action Plan is premature. Why is resource being used so inappropriately and prematurely when the Regulation 19 consultation on Cambridge Wastewater Treatment Plant is not scheduled until February 2022, and the councils are deferring any formal public consultation on NECAP until after the DCO. And the officers have recommended that any subsequent alteration to the area action plan is delegated to individual members and officers, which appears to be at odds with the democratic process. Thank you. Thank you for your Thank question. You. Thank you for your Thank question, you for your Mrs. Stark. Okay. Um, um, I, I will respond on behalf, of the, on behalf of the council. I'm getting an echo from somewhere. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, the Greater Cambridge Local Development Scheme, adopted in July 2020, sets out the council's process for preparing the North East Cambridge Area Action Plan. In respect of the timing of preparing the proposed submission AAP and the reason for that, it says under point nine, significant government housing infrastructure funding has been secured to facilitate the relocation of the Milton Waste Water Treatment Plant, which will enable the development of a major brownfield site and comprehensive planning of the northeast Cambridge area. Anglian Water proposes that a development consent order process will now be undertaken to enable the relocation. Under point 10, the formal agreement by the councils of the proposed submission AAP will be an important factor in the DCO examination process to, dis to demonstrate commitment to development of the area. Therefore, work on the AAP is intended to progress to complete the Regulation 18 stage, consider the responses received, and prepare the proposed submission AAP. The councils would make a decision ahead of the DCO examination to agree the AAP for Regulation 19 publication, but actually carrying out the consultation would be subject to the successful completion of the DCO process because of the need at examination to be able to demonstrate that the development proposed on the site could be delivered. It is therefore anticipated that the AAP process would then pause until the outcome of the DCS, DCO is known. If successful, the councils would then proceed with the publication of the proposed submission AAP for the making of representations under Regulation 19, following which the AAP would progress to submission and examinations. The councils are complying with and implementing the process and timing set out in the adopted local development scheme in bringing the proposed submission AAP to members now for agree agreement ahead of the formal stages of the DCO, pro DCO process progressing in 2022. And Mrs. Starkey, I thank you very much for your question. The next question comes from Mrs. Catherine Martin. Mrs. Martin, would you like to uh, unmute yourself and please ask your question? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question is also in relation to um, uh, item six. Um, so the, the NEC site has been described by officers as the most sustainable site for building in the area. Uh, Caroline Hunt mentioned this um, in her opening um, on November uh, JLPAG meeting. P could you please consider the impact of the release of embedded carbon in the destruction of the sewage plant and the massive carbon impact of rebuilding the sewage plant on precious green belt a couple of fields away. Uh, thank you for your question, yeah. Mrs. Martin. 
at the description given at the JLPAG meeting of the North East Cambridge site was as the most suitable location in Greater Cambridge for development. This referred to the locational benefits in terms of minimising carbon emissions from transport and the opportunity to maximise travel by non-car modes as identified in our evidence. That comment was not intended to relate to a wider, more detailed assessment of the North East Cambridge site that included embodied carbon. It is not possible or appropriate at the plan making stage to undertake a full carbon impact assessment, including arising from demolition and proposed development, because that level of detail is not normally available. The sustainability appraisal supporting the proposed submission AAP considers the cumulative effects of the plan in combination with other plans and projects, including the relocation of the wastewater treatment plant to the, extent of, to the extent appropriate for the stage of the project at the time of the assessment. In terms of embedded carbon associated with the new pr proposal, this is addressed at paragraph 5.36 of the sustainability appraisal. This appraisal will be kept under review as the AAP and the DCO processes move, move forward to take into account any new in, in information. The scoping opinion relating to the development consent order process for the new waste water treatment plant has now been published by the Planning Inspectorate. With specific reference to the decommissioning and demolition of the existing plant, it requires assessment of the cumulative impacts of the proposal for the new works together with the effects of waste generated from de demolition activities at the existing sewage works. This will include an assessment of cumulative carbon impacts. In any event, policy two of the proposed submission area action plan before members requires planning applications to calculate carbon emissions through a whole life carbon assessment to demonstrate actions to reduce life cycle carbon emissions and also to reduce construction waste. The environmental assessment supporting any planning application for development on the North East Cambridge site would be expected to include consideration of the demolition of existing structures on the site and the potential for waste reduction and reuse on site. And this would inform the whole life carbon assessment required by the AAP. The fact that there are different legal processes involved for the AAP and the DCO does not mean that there is any reduction in the level of scrutiny of the projects. All matters will be considered in the correct forum and in the correct way, on both, and both are subject to scrutiny from independent planning inspectors before they can be approved. Thank you very much, Mrs. Martin, for your question. Sorry? They're okay, are they? Yeah. Um, the next question comes from Mr. James Littlewood. James, are you with us? I'm, I'm with you. Uh, good evening, councillors. Thank you very much for allowing me to, to ask my question. Uh, it, my question is in relation to item six as well. There are many uh, things if we would come, uh, I should say I'm from Cambridge Past, Present and Future, for those who, who don't uh, know me. Um, I'll also speak on behalf of Milton Country Park. There are many things to combine in the environmental aspirations for this development, uh, but disappointingly, the provision of natural green space is not one of them. The amount of informal green space meets the minimum amount required to meet the council's policies, but two thirds of this is provided on a business park, described in page 26 of the Open Spaces report as these green spaces aren't perceived as being accessible to the wider public. Would you want to visit a business park for your leisure and recreation? It should be noted that the green space on the business park already exists and would not be new space. Only a third of the green space is provided in conjunction with the housing, and most of this is provided as linear green space or pocket parks. In other words, small areas of green space that are loomed over by high rise buildings. There's one larger park, but the size of this is not provided in any of the documents. 
extrapolating from the plans, we estimate this to be around two and a half to three and a half hectares in size. Figure 20 in your report includes an infographic which aims to compare the amount of open space in the AAP with other Cambridge parks. That comparison is misleading because the parks which are used for comparison are just that, they are parks. A better comparison would be to compare the main park proposed for the new development. At two and a half to three and a half hectares, this is very small in comparison to the other parks, given that it's to cater for 16,000 people. At a bare minimum, the proposals for the AAP might just provide for the day-to-day -day open space needs of new residents, play space for children, somewhere to walk the dog or kick a ball about, and perhaps for formal sports. But what it won't do is provide the kind of green spaces that people in high density developments need access to, which is large natural green space, somewhere they can go for a long walk or run, experience nature and escape the pressures of urban life. There is, of course, somewhere for them to do that, Milton Country Park, and there's a subway proposed under the A14 so that residents can get to it. That would be great if it wasn't for the fact the Country Park is already at capacity and cannot cope with 16,000 more visitors. In the hundreds of pages of text, there's almost no mention of Milton Country Park, let alone of it meeting the needs of the development. There's been no assessment of whether the Country Park has the capacity to cope and what mitigation might be required to enable it to do so. We could see no requirement for Section 106 contributions to support the park to cope, only a rather vague paragraph on page 54 of the Open Spaces and Recreation Topic paper, which refers to the need for resilience and capacity of existing green spaces. Natural England's accessible natural green space standards would require the AAP development to have a large 100 hectare site of accessible natural green space within five kilometres, especially as this development is largely car free, so people need it close by. But there isn't one. To make matters worse, North of Cambridge will also see 20,000 people at North Stowe and 22,000 at Water Beach. So where will these 58,000 people go to meet their green space needs? This is an area which has been highlighted in the evidence space for the next local plan as already suffering from a deficit of green infrastructure and recreational pressure. And it highlights North East Cambridge to Water Beach as a priority area for green infrastructure, marked as critically important. I want you to understand that there's only one option for providing that critical green space, and that's through the Northeast AAP. And therefore it's essential that section 106 contributions are secured towards it. So please will the scrutiny committee recommend that the AAP is not adopted until there is a commitment within the AAP for development contributions towards providing the larger scale green space that will be desperately needed by the future 58,000 residents of Northeast Cambridge, Water Beach and North Stay. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, James, for your question. Um, and in response, I would say that it is important to clarify that the councils are not seeking to adopt the area action plan at this stage. The recommendation to both council scrutiny committees is to agree the AAP and supporting documents for future public consultation following the outcome of the DCO process to relocate the wastewater treatment plant. The AAP requires development to bring forward 27.6 areas of new informal and children's play space across the area, which is the equivalent of around 34.5 football pitches or around three times the size of Parker's Peace. In combination with the existing open spaces at NEC, the development will meet the informal and children's play space requirements in the adopted local plans on site, meaning all residents will have access to open space within a five minute walk of their homes for day to day informal recreation. The existing open spaces within the employment parks will form an important part of uh, North East Cambridge for informal exercise and by providing a range of different types of spaces for people to enjoy. The proposed open spaces are substantial in size. The new large green space is 4.1 hectares, which is around the same size as Christ's Peace, or five football pitches. Similarly, the main linear park is between 70 metres and 100 metres wide, which is the length of a football pitch and over 1.3 kilometres long. As required by the AAP, a landscape-led approach to designing these spaces will ensure that there will be opportunities for people to go for walks, run and experience nature on their doorstep. 
as set out in the first proposal's local plan. The councils are also seeking to bring forward new strategic scale green spaces as well as development. The nearest area identified to North East Cambridge lies immediately north of the A14 between the top of Cambridge, Water, between the top of Cambridge, Water, New, Water Beach, Newtown and North Stone. This could provide a substantial amount of open space to serve not only these developments, but also existing communities. These wider proposals fall outside of the AAP area and due to their more strategic role, will be considered further as the councils prepare the Greater Cambridge Local Plan. It should also be noted that the majority of new homes at North East Cambridge will not come forward until after the plan period 20 years from now. So there is opportunity through the local plan process to address the strategic open space needs for not only North East Cambridgeshire, but also Greater Cambridge and therefore not relying solely on Milton Country Park to meet the recreation, health and well-being of people living in this area. James, I thank you very much for your question. And I believe our final question this evening uh, comes from Mr Daniel Fulton. Uh, Mr Fulton, if you would like to uh, unmute, unmute yourself and uh, present your question, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the best uh, planning policies in the world will not amount to much without effective delivery and enforcement um, um, operations at the council. And unfortunately, um, planning delivery and enforcement is where the council is currently falling short. Um, as members will know, there have been an extraordinary number of irregularities on planning delivery decisions lately, and the council has failed to address these appropriately um, at all. Um, even if all of the concerns that James just made are addressed in the, in the policy making process, um, without effective delivery and enforcement, this development in Northeast Cambridge will end up being just as chaotic as the outcomes we're now seeing in Water Beach uh, and North Stowe. Um, and Mr. Fulton, sorry, may I interrupt? This is, um, are you, delivering a different question to the one that you have. I was just going to, I was just going to sum up. I was just going to say, I was going to run through a long list of, of anomalies and irregularities, but in light of the length of the agenda tonight, I'm not going to do so. Um, and I'll let the committee get on with its business. But the fact is the procedural problems at this local planning authority have to be addressed. Uh, and and um, thank you for taking that uh, into account. Thank you very much. Do I take it, therefore, that you are not proceeding with this question that you have delivered? That's correct, Chair. Thank you very much indeed. So that brings to the end our public questions for this evening. And may I thank all those uh, members for taking, all those members of the public uh, for taking an interest in the uh, Council's business. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Richard Williams. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, just wanted to make a small point. I think just maybe for the clarity of people at home and, and for those of us in the room, uh, could you just clarify that the answers you've given to the questions are answers supplied by council officers rather than your own answers? Um, I'm pretty sure that they will have been provided um, by both uh, officers and uh, members. So, um, we come now to uh, the next item on the agenda and with members agreement I would like to move forward uh, item eight on the agenda which is the audit of the accounts update um, as we have with us our uh, head of finance um, who I'm sure would like an opportunity to go and see his family at some point so um, with members agreement we'll take item eight now and I'll ask uh, Peter to introduce his report. Okay. Thank you. Peter. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so this report is a, just a brief update on the Audit and Governance Committee of 1st of December. Uh, at that meeting, it was reported that there would be a meeting between uh, EY and officers. 
to progress the issues in relation to the fixed asset register. That meeting occurred on the 3rd of December and all information required as a result of that meeting was passed to EY by the 8th of December. So as things stand at the moment, EY have all the information that they need and we're just waiting for a response from them um, whilst they look through the papers that they've got. And that's the position we have at the moment. Thank you very much, Mr. Maddock. Uh, do any members have any questions for uh, Head of Finance? No, only in the room. Are there, uh, Dr. Williams? Thank you, Chair. Um, could I just ask Mr. Maddock, or Councillor Williams, really, as he's the political lead responsible for this, um, could you give us an update on the uh, fees, the additional fees that have been incurred to date by EY in dealing with this? We had an update, I think, on that in earlier in November. So. I'd be grateful for that. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, I don't have an update at this stage, but um, I can raise this with EY and I'll have to report back on that. So I'll, I'll get onto them and find out. We'll come back to you, Dr. Williams. Thank you for your question. Uh, are there any questions from any of our remote members? No? Good. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Malik. Thank you for your report. So we now come to uh, item six on the agenda, which is uh, the substantive item for this evening's business. Um, it is a very extensive report running to in excess of 300 pages. So I will invite, first of all, uh, the League Cabinet Member for Planning, Dr. Tumi Hawkins, to introduce her report. And then I will open discussion for Firstly, local members who are present here in the committee room, then followed by local members who are uh, joining us remotely. Uh, then any questions from members who are here in person and any members of this committee who are joining us remotely. And finally, uh, by any other councillors who may be present. But could I ask you all um, to please make your comments brief but concise and if a point that you have made has been uh, made previously by one of your fellow councillors um, please do not repeat it but I will now invite councillor Dr Jimmy Hawkins to introduce her report Jimmy uh, thank you very much chairman um, good evening again and to you and members of the scrutiny committee and those online. Um, my introduction is going to be in two parts, Chairman, if you don't mind, me in here and uh, Terry online. The report you have in front of you today is the culmination of years of work by both South Cam's District Council and Cambridge City Council in one guise or another on the area that is now called North East Cambridge. It used to be called the Cambridge Northern Fringe when it was first identified in the Cambridge Structure Plan in 1989. And there was some work, early work done in 1996 to inform the Cambridge Local Plan. And that study concluded that whilst the area offered a unique opportunity for substantial and appropriate development, the cost of relocating the wastewater treatment plant and possibly the Cambridge Business Park would result in the development not being viable at that time. And there were various other studies, uh, 2003, 2004. And in 2006, in the light of the evidence from Anglian Water on operational risks and on the amount of land which could be released for development, the independent planning inspector examining the Cambridge Local Plan concluded that the only realistic options were either complete relocation or retention of the current site. And through the public inquiry, it was acknowledged that the redevelopment of Cambridge Northern Fringe could not fully go ahead unless the wastewater treatment plant was relocated. And more work followed, 2006, 7, and 8, looking at how this area could be redeveloped. And it wasn't until 2014 that the then Joint Strategic Transport and Special Planning Group 
meeting on the 6th of February 2014 um, agreed the scope and approach for that project, including early work on preparing the Joint Area Action Plan and the overall approach to developing this site. And that approach was agreed by South Cambridgeshire District Council at the planning portfolio holder meeting of 11 February 2014. Now, of course, the work was paused um, until 2018 because the then um, plan that was submitted for examination um, in 2014 wasn't completed, or at least the examination wasn't completed until 2017. And the plans for both South Cams and um, Cambridge City local plans were adopted. One thing, though, in the meantime, uh, the combined authority at its meeting of September 2017 decided to put forward the bid to cover the cost of relocating the wastewater plant as the only expression of interest uh, from Cambridge and Peterborough area for the government's housing infrastructure fund. Now, as you probably are aware, both the local plans for the city and South Camps, which was adopted in 2018, include a policy allocating their respective sections um, of Northeast Cambridge um, for development. And that policy for South Camps is SS4. And it states that the amount of development, the site capacity, the viability, the time scales, and phasing will be established through the preparation of the area action plan for the site. And it will be developed jointly between South Cambridge District Council and Cambridge City Council and will involve close collaborative working with Cambridgeshire County Council, Anglian Water and other stakeholders. And ladies and gentlemen, this is what you now have before you today. An area action plan that has had a tremendous amount of work gone into it by the uh, policy team working with partners. It has undergone further consultations and as a result of that work, the NEC area is one of the sites we now put forward in the local plan first proposals. And uh, it's got a tag assigning 3,900 houses in the plan period up to 2041. It is proposed to be an exceptional green, low carbon living community where active travel, not the car, is king or queen. The AAP sets out how this area, which has multiple landowners and current users, can be developed in a coherent way in multiple phases over time to maximize the opportunity that it presents. There's a fair amount of technical detail in it, uh, which you will hear about shortly in the presentation that Terry uh, will be making. So without further ado, I will shut up and uh, hand over to Terry to tell you more about it. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Dr. Hawkins. Terry, can I invite you to unmute yourself and address the committee, please? Yeah, thank you, Chair, and thank you, committee. Um, I'm just gonna pass over first of all to Caroline, who's gonna start the presentation, um, and then I will then do the, the majority of it. So I'm just gonna quickly share my screen. I should have said welcome to you both, by the way. My apologies. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So, um, yes, we. I, I'm just going to say a few words before handing over to Terry, just really to set the um, North East Cambridge Air Action Plan into context within the uh, Greater Cambridge Local Plan, which uh, Councillor Hawkins just uh, referred to briefly. Um, so, Terry, on the next slide, please. Um, so, as, as Councillor Hawkins said, North East Cambridge has been identified as a key part of the Greater Cambridge Local Plan first proposals and the consultation that uh, closed uh, at the beginning of this week. Um, and our evidence showed that this was uh, the most sustainable location for, for development um, in terms of reducing car use and, and, and so on, as was referred to in the, one of the public questions earlier. Um, 
the preferred policy direction in the local plan draws some of the headlines from the proposed area action plan, in particular up to three eight thousand three hundred and fifty dwellings in total, with around four thousand during the plan period, around fifty thousand new jobs, with only some of those anticipated during the plan period, and having uh, appropriate infrastructure and, and mitigation to support the development. And the other point I just wanted to raise before uh, handing over to Terry is is about the relationship with the wastewater treatment plant, because this is an issue that I know a lot of people um, uh, are interested in, and it is quite a technical uh, distinction between the two processes, but they are two separate legal processes. And the Area Action Plan is very much predicated upon the wastewater treatment plant being relocated. And it's therefore contingent on that separate development consent order process um, being approved for the new plant. Therefore, the decision by the councils that we're, we're recommending to you um, on the proposed mission area action plan, the process would then be paused while the DCO goes through its process, which is due to move to the next stages um, during next year. Um, and on the current timetable, we think it's likely to be around 2024 before that formal um, consultation could take place. But of course, with that amount of uh, length of pause, we will, of course, need to undertake a health check to see whether changes in circumstance mean that there's a need to update evidence or indeed change the area action plan itself. Um, and the North East Cambridge AAP sustainability appraisal and the habitats regulation assessment that go with it do consider the cumulative impacts of the uh, area action plan with other plans and projects, such as the relocation of the water treatment plant. So there is a two separate processes, but there are relationships between the two. So I'll hand over to Terry now to talk to you more about the area action plan itself. Thank you, Caroline. Um, so yes, as Councillor Hawkins mentioned earlier, um, we've been through three rounds of consultation on the area action plan to date. Um, the most recent one was in 2020 when we consulted on the draft plan and we received four, just around 4,200 comments um, during that consultation. Um, that has helped inform the proposed submission plan, which is in front of members this evening. And in total, there's been around 6,900 comments received over those three rounds of consultation. The main issues from the last consultation were around the lack of open space provision, um, the heights and densities were considered to be too high, too many uh, proposed jobs, which then has a knock on effect in terms of um, in commuting into the area by private car, and also not enough clarity on the community facilities that were being proposed as part of the development. So as a result, um, the team have been working really hard in um, updating the area action plan as well as the spatial framework that sits within it. Um, we are now looking at a reduction in building heights, so generally four to six storeys rather than generally five to eight, and the maximum building height of 10 storeys rather than 13. That's been informed by some significant evidence that we've been undertaking alongside Historic England. Uh, we, we are retaining the housing numbers on the site, as Caroline mentioned, but we're reducing the average densities to around a gross of 100 dwellings per hectare. Um, that's uh, broadly um, kind of comparable with a lot of the developments in and around Cambridge uh, that have come forward recently. Um, as mentioned, there's a reduction in the number of uh, in the amount of office floor space and therefore office jobs down from 20,000 to 15,000. Uh, and we are still looking at retaining the existing amount of industrial floor space within North East Cambridge. We've also clarified the infrastructure and supporting community facilities through the infrastructure delivery plan. And we've now agreed the transport strategy and strengthened the transport policies within the plan. Uh, open space, as I mentioned, was a key issue. We're now meeting the informal and children's play space standards in full on site. Um, so in addition to the existing open spaces within Cambridge Science Park, the AAP is now looking at providing 27.6 hectares of open space. And as the chair mentioned earlier, that's the equivalent of around 34 and a half football pitches or three Parker's pieces. Um, there's a picture of Parker's piece uh, for memory, uh, just to jog everyone's memory. Um, 
there, there will therefore be um, ample space for informal recreation, biodiversity, and also space to support people's health and well-being. Uh, and that's just not the people that are living on the site, but also those that will be working there as well. The new central park, um, the sort of triangular in shape, is about 4.1, 4.2 hectares. And again, that's about half the size of Parker's piece, whilst the linear park is um, 70 to 100 metres wide and at kind of 0.8 miles long. That's a good sort of 15, 16 minute walk. Um, the, the open spaces have been laid out to incorporate existing tree belts, protected hedgerows, uh, key walking and cycling corridors, the first public drain which runs through the site, and also other infrastructure requirements. In terms of allotment provision, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be expecting uh, food growing spaces to be provided on site, and we'd expect them in, in forms such as rooftop provision, podium level, within courtyards of developments, as well as actually within the public realm itself. And we've got lots of examples of how that's been successfully delivered elsewhere, uh, both in the UK and abroad. Uh, and also a community garden within the area as well. Any residual uh, allotment provision that isn't going to be met on site, would we, we would expect that to be provided off site. So there'd be no um, uh, sort of deficiency in, in allotment provision. It'll be provided on site and potentially off as well. In terms of formal sports provision, uh, we're looking at delivering this for innovative means like multi-use courts. In total, it will deliver around 9% of the standards and the rest of it we'd expect to be delivered off site. Now we have looked at how you could potentially increase increase that provision on site, but it does have quite a big impact on a range of other factors like housing numbers, uh, building heights and densities, or even informal sport, informal open space and children's play space provision. So the way the AAP has been prepared, we feel that we've got the right balance between all of the different competing uses, but all of the different types of spaces and facilities that we are looking to provide. So just to give you an example, just to deliver 20% of the local plan standards on site for outdoor sports would require an extra four hectares of, of open space, uh, four, four hectares of land, which is the equivalent of that orange or yellow kind of box, which has just popped up on the diagram. Within that area is 1,150 homes. So if we wanted to maintain the number of homes on the site and provide um, an extra four hectares of formal open sports, we would then actually start to look at potentially increasing the heights and densities of the blocks that I've highlighted with the purple arrows. And that would actually push heights back up to around eight to 13 storeys and push densities back up to 275 to 350 dwellings per hectare. Now. This could be you could you could deliver this in a million different ways, and this is just one example. But I just wanted to show you the knock-on effect of trying to deliver um, additional types of of um, spaces within the AAP area, and what that then does to jobs, homes, open spaces, etc. In terms of indoor sports provision, um, the AAP will be delivering uh, an indoor sports court on site as per the standards. And in terms of swimming pool provision, it doesn't generate the development doesn't generate the need for a full four lane swimming pool. So we're therefore seeking contributions towards a new pool at West Cambridge. Now, that's not to say that people at NEC will have to go to West Cambridge to use the pool. Uh, we've done some work and we've, we've identified that within a 10 to 15 minute cycle ride of NEC, you have Impington Sports College, Jesus Green Lido, Cheston Sports Centre, Abbey Leisure Complex and Parkside Pools. So actually um, looking at kind of pool provision within the local area, the um, um, North East Cambridge is quite well uh, located in, in that sense. Now, obviously, there's there's been a historic um, um, undersupply of swimming pool provision in South Cambridgeshire, and a lot of local residents end up using the pools within the city. Now, as, the, as swimming pools come on board at Water Beach Newtown, Camborne West, and also North Stow, North Stow uh, this would change the catchments and demands for the pools within the swim, within the city, uh, and we will therefore need to look at this um, as we progress the new local plan, um, and and sort of look at um, current and future growth sites as they come on board, and look at it in a much more holistic way. Uh, these are just some precedent examples of open space provision, such as food growing spaces, neighbourhood parks some sports courts, and also incorporating biodiversity into urban environments. 
Now, in terms of um, the local plan, we are identifying opportunities to enhance green infrastructure and provide strategic scale open spaces, as being mentioned earlier during the uh, one of the uh, responses to the public question. Uh, Cheston Fen, which is the land to the east of North East Cambridge between the railway line and the river, is identified for biodiversity enhancements and informal amenity space, uh, which will be accessed via a new foot and cycle bridge over the railway. So that will give people opportunity to move um, over towards um, the river corridor and the public foot footpath network in that area. Now, the green infrastructure strategy for the in the local plan identifies new strategic green space north of Cambridge, which goes up to Water Beach, Newtown and Northstow. Now, this space would not only serve North East Cambridge, but also existing communities and those growth sites. So the, lo the local plan is looking at the possibility of introducing a strategic open space standard because that, such a standard doesn't currently exist in either of the adopted local plans. And additionally, the infrastructure delivery study for North East Cambridge notes that contribution should be sought towards off-site green infrastructure provision as a result of the development. Some of the some of the key benefits uh, very quickly summarised include limiting car journeys, no fossil fuels and a 20% biodiversity net gain, 40% uh, affordable housing, 15,000 new jobs, um, both of which wouldn't come forward all over the plan period, they would go beyond 2041, as well as reproviding the existing industrial floor space, which is really important to the local economy. New connections into the existing communities, significant employment and training opportunities, as well as new services and facilities that would be accessible to them. Uh, water supply is a key issue for the area of action plan and wider local plan. The phasing of development at North East Cambridge reflects this issue, um, and the AAP uh, will uh, the pause in the AAP process allows the councils to consider the Water Resources East Water Management Plan, which is expected to be finalised in 2023. Um, on the 30th of November, um, officers took this uh, report to the Joint Local Plan Advisory Group, um, as, as also set out in the report to this item. Um, some of the comments that were made were that we should, um, the, la the council's land ownership, that's both city and South Cambridgeshire council's land ownership should be made clearer um, to be more transparent. Um, the members supported the increase in open space, but had queries on the uh, formal sports and swimming pool provision and the scale of the spaces provided. The impacts on Milton Country Park, they queried reductions in heights and densities, um, they supported the water usage requirements and limitations to 80 litres per person per day. And they also questioned the provision of jobs at North East Cambridge and how that fed into the Greater Cambridge Local Plan uh, first proposals. Uh, one key issue uh, that came out as a result of the consultation as well was the Fen Road level crossing. Now, the level crossing and the Fen Road area does not fall within the AAP area, but we know that it is a key issue. Um, Network Rail recently consulted on their Ely Area Capacity Study, which looks at level crossings in this area and beyond. Uh, and unfortunately, it was not proposed to be closed through that consultation uh, study. So officers are continuing to seek engagement with Network Rail on this matter because we know it is a key local issue. Through the local plan forum that we have established, uh, Network Rail um, reaffirmed that commitment to work with officers on this issue at the uh, Cambridge North Area Committee um, in mid-November. Just to sort of wrap up to, uh, the presentation, in terms of the key changes to the spatial framework, the draft plan on the left and the proposed submission plan on the right, all homes will now be within a five minute walk of an open space and a local or district centre that will meet their day-to-day -day needs. We've got 10 new or improved connections in and around the site. Open spaces uh, and key walking and cycling routes have been aligned. We have car barns, which are essentially consolidated uh, multi-storey car parks that will consolidate parking for not only the homes, but also the jobs. Um, and we're also proposing enhanced landscape buffers to the east and the north of the site to try and mitigate the impacts of development on the um, heritage and landscape uh, sensitive areas um, to the north and to the east. And just to remind everybody of the process and future key dates, uh, the top ones obviously this evening, then in January, we go to South Cambridgeshire Cabinet and the Cambridge Planning and Transport Spruce Committee on the 10th and 11th of January. The development consent order process is anticipated from next year to 2024, at which point um, 
if that is successful, we will then consult on the proposed submission AAP around 2024 before examination and then potentially uh, and then hopefully adoption. Thank you, Chair. Happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Terry and Caroline. Um, members, I'll now open the uh, matter for discussion, firstly by the members, local members who are here. And may I remind you that we are invited to take note of the report and to make recommendations to Cabinet. So whilst you are talking, I will be making a note of the recommendations that we can deliver to Cabinet, along with the report in due course. And I believe our first speaker this evening is Councillor Anna Bradman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I hope you will um, indulge me uh, as local member, uh, and I'm sure alongside the other local members, there are a number of things I would like to raise uh, that should be brought, I would like to be brought to Cabinet. So I have five or six questions, if that's okay. So, um, firstly, members, I'd like to draw your attention to the statements on um, page 65 of the plan, 93 of our agenda. From here on in, I'll just refer to the numbers on the plan. So this is page 65, and it states that this will be a bustling new city district, uh, admittedly well integrated into the surrounding communities, and then a new district which should feel like part of Cambridge. And I'm pointing that out because what I want to clarify is that the intention is that this should not be part of the village of Milton. It's part of Cambridge City. So the first thing I wanted to identify is that um, I wanted to resist any um, suggestion that anybody might call it Milton anything. I want it to be at least considered that the area that it lies in is East Chesterton. And I think any naming might sensibly reflect that location. Albeit, um, we are, it is in, the, it is in the, the, many parts of it are in the parish and district of Milton, but the majority of the area that we're developing is in East Chesterton. So, just a thought about the naming. But that also brings me on to my concerns about the green space. So, what I wanted to point out is that I'm very concerned, we've heard about um, informal open space and play space but what I am particularly concerned about is open space for formal play is formal so this is recreation grounds sports pitches and such like now if I just, may just point out to you that on page uh, 14 of the uh, plan which I'll go to now this is the infographic where it, where it reminds us that in future it is hoped, and I know this is a long-term plan, but in future this area of the city will have homes for 16,000 residents in 8,350 homes-ish, and it will also have some 15,000 jobs on site. So I'm concerned not only for green space for the residents, but also for sports clubs associated with the employment uses on site. And remind, let us remind ourselves, members, this is 31,000 people who might be using this area. So my concern, and I hear what um, Mr. D'Souza has pointed out to us about the implications of that relative to the housing numbers, but I just wanted us to bear in mind that elsewhere in the plan, at policy 8 on page 81, it refers to the fact that, and I'll read from it, um, we're talking about quantitative delivery, provision of outdoor sports facilities will be met through a combination of on-site provision and funding towards new or improved off-site facilities. And that includes uh, reference to the area north and elsewhere it refers to access to Milton Country Park, but also in this paragraph below it refers to improving the recreational access to the River Cam. Now I just wanted to point out, if I may just take you on a brief diversion into Mil Milton Village itself. For our existing local plan, a study was done called the Recreation and Open Space Study 
dated, admittedly, 2013, so quite some time ago, and this looked at the village of Milton. And at that time, it said that, uh, bear in mind, members, that provision of recreational space is based on population. And at that time, it identified that it, the village of Milton needed additional recreational space, and that included one ad adult football or sports pitch, one junior come senior sports pitch, and two mini soccer pitches. So that was a total of four pitches of various sizes and quantums, but that was before the delivery of North Lodge Park, and we're very fortunate that through careful negotiation, we managed to achieve two new sports pitches uh, delivered at Nor North Lodge Park, but that's, those are of the smaller size. And so actually what we recognize is that even compared to the data in 2013, since which of course our population has increased, we still need to supply the recreational leads of Milton Village to the tune of two football pitches. And I would point out that we have two, um, a number of very well used sports pitches and we have recently had to refuse um, businesses on the science park access to our sports pitches because we have to protect them. These are grass pitches which are used very intensively over the weekends by various clubs in Milton. And so whilst we don't mind them using in the summer for businesses when the pitch is more resilient, we have not been able to grant them access during the winter because the pitches need time to recover from the very intensive use. So this is just to give you a, a, a view that yes, indeed, Milton um, could do with uh, additional sports pitch, but that's for it is its own population, not for an additional population of 16,000 or indeed 31,000. So if we come back to the open space, the reason I'm concerned about it is because I think this, uh, and to use an expression often used by Mr. David Allett of Transport. This development needs to wash its own face, in my view, and it needs to be sustainable within itself. Um, there is reference to um, the, the development needing to, um, here we are, at um, page 156, we are referred to the fact that, if you'll bear with me while I find it. I can't find it, here we are. Yes, it refers to, this is talking about shops and local services, but the same applies to the community. It's saying um, that it wants to meet the daily needs of its own local residents, employees, and visitors, while not creating a destination location for people living further afield. In other words, it didn't want to make Northeast Cambridge into a honeypot for other areas, for the very good reason that transport in this area is highly constrained and congested. So what it wanted to do was provide for itself. But given that it's trying not to be a destination for other people, um, my concern is that it shouldn't be, it, it would be unfortunate, um, at an extreme you might say hypocritical, to then use facilities outside this, in the surrounding area to provide informal recre oh, formal recreation space. So I'm concerned that the space that's on offer um, is all for funding towards new or improved off-site facilities. And I'm just hoping that the intention is not to use facilities in Milton. I I'm pleased to hear reference to the green space to the northwest of Cambridge between North Stow, Water Beach and the A14, because clearly there is much more space in that area. But that's clearly not within walking distance of the development. So I'm, I'm concerned that we shouldn't be... Um, the, I mean, the note on page 82 refers to the fact that um, 
for open space requirements where there are deficiencies in certain types of open space provision in the area surrounding a proposed development, the Council will seek to prioritise the, those open spaces deficient in the area. Um, but I hope that doesn't mean that all of the delivery um, will be in communities that are already struggling to provide their own space. So that's my point about open green space, the formal space for play, and there doesn't seem to be very much at all in northeast Cambridge. My second point relates to um, cemetery space. Um, I can't see any reference whatsoever in the northeast Cambridge area action plan to the need for burial space. Um, and the implication is that space might be used elsewhere. And again, the parish of Milton has provision for its um, current population, but we already um, feel that our provision of space is limited and we need to safeguard that space for burial of residents from within Milton Parish. Uh, and we would like to see some reference in this area action plan for designation and safeguarding of space for burials, please. Thirdly, um, I would like to see reference to space for faith uh, and for worship. Um, there is one mention that I saw, I didn't delve too deeply, but there is reference on page 152 when it talks about community space um, let me just find it. Under community facilities um, in the section policy 14, social community and cultural facilities, uh, there is a reference buried in the middle of a paragraph talking about the need for different types of facilities to support the development in this area, identified community and cultural facilities that should be provided comprise a library and community centre, community rooms that could facilitate several uses, including youth clubs, worship groups, as well as spaces to enable community events to take place. Now bear in mind, this is going to be some potentially 31,000 users. Uh, I would like to see formal designated space for faith, uh, because I think that will actually not only help this community to be developed as a community, and it will create coherence and cohesion in the community. And um, not to mention the fact that I think there are some faiths that require separate space from other religions. So I think we need to um, acknowledge that if this is to be a, a vibrant and um, inclusive development. Um, just passing reference, I'm very glad to see there's designated provision for health also on page 152, and I'm glad to see that's being recognised. Um, the other aspect I want to mention is, and indeed uh, Mr. D'Souza and Caroline Hunt mentioned this, I would very much like to see provision for safeguarding of space towards a vehicle bridge for my residence at Fen Road, Chesterton. Absolutely, there are concerns about the closure, the, you know, the, the inevitable increased downtime at the level crossing at Fen Road, Chesterton. And that means that we really do need to make provision for a, another vehicle access out of Fen Road, Chesterton. And, and logically, it means into this development. The reason I'm asking for that is there are not only some 500 residents at the remote side of the level crossing in Fen Road, Chesterton, but there are also, I estimate, um, some two to 200 possibly employees. And remember, these are not small businesses, some of them are small businesses, but we have um, skip sites, we have a, re, uh, a, a major recycling site there, we have um, a, a a very well used, um, oh, what do you call it? Um, furniture for office, office furniture uh, site down there for which large lorries need access. We also have numerous mobile home sites down there and, and a number of other 
very active industries. There is a lot of toing and froing over the level crossing at present. And if the downtime is increased, in other words, the time by which people can actually access and exit Benrow Chesterton, we need to make provision for them to have vehicular access through another route. So I would like there to be consideration given to the footprint of a bridge. And I know that people won't want that because it will reduce the amount of space available for housing. But I really do think that if we don't do this now, if we don't safeguard that land now and we just build it out, we will condemn all those residents and employees on the far side of the level crossing at Fenrow Chesterton to only ever being able to get out of Fenrow Chesterton for about 20 minutes in the hour in the morning peak and similarly in the evening peak. And I don't think that's acceptable. So thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I think that's all I've got to say. Thank you very much, Councillor Bradman. I have, I have made copious notes. Um, I think next we come to Councillor Judith Ripper. I've also got quite a few um, points to make, although some of them touch on Councillor Bradman, so I'm going to try and not repeat. Um, the main point I'd like to draw members' um, attention to and um, anyone interested, um, page 18 of the um, agenda pack, I'll just go by the main page numbers. I was just looking at the mention, first of all, of Milton Country Park and indeed green space. Um, I can see that this um, new version of the AAP has, is trying to address the green space and there has been improvements in it, but I'm still really concerned that and take it like this, that you can't imagine everybody will spend all their time on site. For example, during the week, they might use the green spaces on site, but as a weekend, you tend to, as is natural for any human being, to go slightly further afield. And I do think the access of the underpass is really good. It should be accessible with walking... Um, sorry, pedestrians, um, cyclists, equestrians, and that's a, a good aspect. However, um, one of the first places you're going to land up is Milton Country Park. Doesn't this look nice? And it is at capacity. And so we really need to work into this um, AAP some form of Section 106 for future development of Milton Country Park. I know the land which is most probable for that is not part of the area, and I understand that from the answer to James Littlewood's question, but it is an issue, and otherwise the country park will just become a park with not much country left because there will be so many people tra um, trampling across it. Um, biodiversity is obviously a major feature of trying to create a place which is both quite urban and yet also offers biodiversity. So you could have a situation where you're increasing the biodiversity in the current location of North East Cambridge, but by, um, by mistake almost, you're reducing that biodiversity just across the A14 and in a different area. So they are the the things which have really, I suppose, jump out at me as um, items which have to be addressed. And this may not be a particularly popular opinion, but I'm kind of known for this, I think. I don't mind height. And actually, if that means you can improve the provision of sports facilities on site, for example, in an urban district, I would go slightly higher with some of the buildings because then you're using your space more efficiently and it provides more green space, or it can provide more green space. Um, that's the main points. There was one or two extra points that I wanted to really um, 
praise, and I can see how much work has gone into this already, and this, this um, development could work. I think it could be truly, you know, groundbreaking in what it's trying to do. And it's one aspect which, again, with Cheston Fen, and I completely concur with all the comments um, Councillor Brandon has made about that area being quite cut off and we need to have a bridge. Um, it just has to happen. Um, but on page 90, we've got information here about enhanced biodiversity in that area. And because of flooding that you wouldn't want to put um, specific open space or play areas, but you could make that into quite a good kind of um, not quite a wetland, but um, really increase the biodiversity. So I think that's something which is excellent and please can we have that. I think I've covered the main points, but I know that um, Councillor Bear Park um, would also like to speak and he's the next member, the, the final member of um, Milton Walsh Beach Ward, but he's online, so back to you, Chair. Well, I did say we'd, do, we'd, we'd seek comments from local members in the committee room first. So I'm going to go to Councillor Daunton first, and then I'll come to uh, Councillor Bear Park immediately afterwards. Thank you. Oh, um, and Graham too. Thank you, Chair. I've got a few um, interconnected points. Um, so in her introduction, um, Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins set out um, the sort of time frame um, which brought us to where we are now. Um, and I think there were significant uh, decisions in 2014 15 when there were consultations, and 2017 um, when the infrastructure fund bid was put in for um, the move of the water treatment plant. Um, and I just wondered if we could now look forward to where, how, what the time frame is for the uh, building out the first phase of the area of the housing and the infrastructure for the area action plan. Um, in one of the parts of the presentation, a number of a figure was put on four and a half thousand houses. What is the time frame for the development of the site? We've been hearing that this has been on the card since 1989. Significant decisions in 2014, 15. A significant decision on the move of the water treatment plant, the decision to move it in 2017. Um, are we looking to 2040, 2050? If you could give us some idea of the scale and time frame for the development, um, that, that's, that's one issue. Um, second question is um, about the DCO process. If uh, the DCO uh, bid by Anglian Water is not successful, uh, or, or, or it falls, shall I say falls, um, where does that leave the area action plan? Um, and, and third question, um, slightly different, what's the relationship between this site and the neighbouring uh, villages, not just Milton and Water Beach, but Fendit and, um, and Horning Sea. And what's the porousness between the site and uh, neighbouring areas? Um, and I, I will just make a comment on height and density. I'm, I'm actually very pleased um, that earlier comments on height and density have been taken into account. Uh, particularly for um, the villages of um, Fenditton and Horningsea and Kwai. Um, I think light pollution is very important. I think density is very important. Um, and the, the porousness between those villages and, and this new site. Thank you, um, Councillor Daunton. I'll come to uh, Councillor Bear Park and then we'll perhaps... Um, ask or invite a comment from um, Councillor Hawkins. So, uh, Councillor Cohn too, my apologies. So let's go to, to Councillor Bear Park first. Paul. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have three points. Um, I'd just like to echo 
uh, Councillor Braddon's and Councillor Rippett's uh, comments about the pressure on Milton Country Park. Um, I think an example of the pressure it's already under is the fact that they've had to abandon the park run uh, because there were too many people going to it. Uh, and it looks like the park run will not, uh, will not continue there. Um, also echoing their comments about the connectivity of uh, chests and fen um, to and the, and the problems with the access and the and the level crossing and the importance for ensuring that there is connectivity to that community. Um, my second point is is about car parking. Um, so policy 22 isn't specific about the number of car parking spaces at Cambridge North. Um, but I understand the proposals are for 628 uh, car parking spaces, um, which seems to me to be excessive. Um, I'd be concerned about the pressure that that adds to in terms of the um, congestion at the A10, A14 junction. Um, I, I would prefer it not to be called a car barn, but a car park, uh, which is specifically what it is, or a multi-storey car park. Um, I note that there are very few spaces for car parking, if any, being provided at Cambridge South. Um, I Just as an example, St Albans, uh, which is a, a home county's commuter town, um, where a very large proportion of the population travel into London, has 588 spaces. Uh, and I don't think this is intended as a commuter town station. Um, so I would say it's contrary to the policy uh, 16 for sustainable travel. Uh, so I'd like uh, the number of spaces at Cambridge North to be uh, reconsidered. Um, my third point is just about the uh, Water Beach Greenway. Uh, I just wanted to be noted that the GCP, the Water Beach Greenway is split into two phases. Uh, phase one, which has been approved and phase two, which, which hasn't. Um, and I noticed there's lots of references to the Water Beach Greenway and the underpass under the A14. Uh, but as far as I know, um, at the moment, the GCP has no uh, plans to uh, approve phase two, or I haven't seen it on any agendas or uh, any consideration at the moment. Um, it's just if that if that is going to be part of this scheme, um, I think we need to understand what the GCP's um, plans for the phase two of the Water Beach Greenway are. And that's all of my points. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Baerpock. Uh, I'll now come to uh, Councillor Graham Cohn. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, I'll try not to repeat too much. My first point was going to be on um, Milton Country Park. Um, you know, I'm someone that takes my children to Milton Country Park quite a lot. And, you know, anyone that has been there will understand just, you know, how busy it already is. Um, so I was just really, you know, building on the point, have we done a proper impact assessment on what this development will have on uh, Milton Country Park, essentially, with all the additional families and uh, businesses that will be using that space if, if the, the links are, are, are done well, like um, alluded to in the report. Um, my second point was um, um, that I really wanted it to be noted that I, I worry that this document going forward for consultation in, in its current form um, without um, mention of the water treatment plan, um, you know, specifically detailed in that, that it has to move, you know, it isn't transparent enough. And I think there should have been more um, reference in this report about the water treatment part plant moving. I know um, Caroline Hunt um, talked about the planning process as being totally different, which which I accept, but one doesn't happen without the other. Um, I know one of the other, other councillors talked about the DCSO at, at DCO and what would happen if if that failed. Um, uh, I, I'd, I'd flip that round and say what would happen if we didn't go forward with the uh, planning uh, well, sort of kneecap as a planning application. Um, you know, my fear would be we'd have to put 8,000 houses somewhere else within the local plan or 
um, not have as many houses in the local plan. But um, I don't think that is highlighted enough within this report. And I don't think it's sort of transparent enough about the water treatment plant moving. So I wanted that noted. Um, the other, I think um, one of the other councillors had already mentioned car parking, which I was going to ask about. Mainly my concern was the impact on surrounding um, uh, sort of neighbourhoods, especially sort of Milton. You know, if <coughs> will there be an implication on people parking in, in, in other villages surrounding that new development? Um, and and the, other, the other point I just want to make quickly was on page um, 181, where we talk about community facilities. I, I wondered if um, uh, we could add in there about community workspaces. So um, we, we've talked about libraries and various community uh, spaces, but, you know, especially since COVID and if we want to try and make this a sustainable green development, um, you know, uh, having sort of shared office or community space with um, good Wi-Fi, uh, possibly communal computers um, where people can work locally to where they live. I just wondered if that had been, yeah, I, I may have missed it in the report, but um, I wondered if you could expand on that a little bit as well. Um, yeah, thanks for that. That's all my points. Well, I'll, I'll, look, Richard, may I come to you in a moment? I, we've, we've heard a, an awful lot from councillors, and I wonder if at this stage, um, before we go any further, councillor Jimmy Hawkins would like to comment on any of the points that have been raised. Thank you very much, Chairman. Where do I start? Um, let me, I, I want to thank you all for your comments. Um, and um, I can assure you that a lot of, I mean, the issues that you have raised, we have, you know, sort of juggled this and thrown this up and down and tried to come up with what we thought um, was a re reasonable compromise. Um, on the issue of um, what if the water treatment works doesn't move. Now, obviously, that is a decision that will be made um, in the DCO process, we don't know what the outcome of that is. Um, but if the outcome is that it doesn't move, then that means we will need to relook at the AAP. And as I said earlier on, we have um, tagged this site with potentially 3,900 homes um, in the emerging Greater Cambridge Local Plan which is for the plan period up to 2041. What that means is we would have to relook at where that 3,900 homes will go in the Greater Cambridge area. Um, and also, uh, if I can tag on to that, you know, there's issues of the um, uh, Fen Road and said garden land and, um, you know, being, being able to allow those from down in Fenwood to access, uh, a second access for them. Um, bear in mind that a lot of work has gone into uh, the trip budget for, uh, for the NEC. And I think you would have heard from some of the briefings we've had, David Allett talking about um, you know, trip budgets. And Milton Road is congested already, which is why you have to have a limit on those street budgets. And if you were to allow further um, vehicular traffic into that site, you would have to go back again <laughs> um, and really look at what can or cannot be allowed um, you know, within that trip. But it will trip that trip budget very severely. And yes, there's the issue of land take, but one thing to bear in mind is the uh, network rail have actually just finished, I think, what they called the, um, uh, the Ely Area Capacity Enhancement um, Consultation, which looked at the, um, the amount of time that the barrier was going to be down or up and increasing um, number of trains through that. 
Now, the conclusion of that was that they didn't need to close the um, barrier. There, there, there is, as far as I know, and I'm sure perhaps um, Mr. Kelly or Caroline will be able to expand more, um, there is no further, as of now, plan to do anything to that um, crossing. <laughs> so, but bear in mind, we do have um, uh, a cycleway proposed from Northeast Cambridge across to Fen Road. So at least that way there is still um, a connection between the two. So it's not completely blocked off, it's that it's more to do with cycling and walking rather than um, vehicular transport. Um, I think in terms of um, community facilities, again, there's a lot of discussion that's gone on <laughs> on this issue. And I take your point about faith, um, faith organizations, some of whom actually do not want to share space. <laughs> um, but we've also done a lot of work, I think it was with NOSTO, I'm sure officers can expand a bit more on that, where some faith groups were happy to share. <laughs> Um, and I think that sort of um, uh, outcome was what potentially we're looking at here as well. But we'll take your point, um, and if we need to obviously um, look at what else could be done. I don't know about the cemetery, though. <laughs> um, I think, Chairman, if I um, stop at this point, and I'll hand over to Caroline, who might be able to answer some more of the questions, and if necessary, um, Mr. Kelly, who is also online. Thank you. Thank you very much, a brave effort. Um, Caroline, would you like to come in or is it Stephen? I'm sorry. Chair, could I, could I, could I start and perhaps yes, um, hand on to, to, to Caroline? Because I, I want to deal with, with, in a sense, a comment that a number of people have made about, um, in, in many respects, the balance that we have struck um, uh, in the plan uh, around some of the some of the kind of headline issues uh, of open space and development quantums and and, and so on uh, and um, as everyone has noted uh, in the previous rounds of consultation um, uh, we had a different balance than we've got now but um, a couple of important points obviously this is this is effectively the largest brownfield site um, uh, genuinely brownfield sites. The airport, Cambridge Airport, you could argue, is is not all brown, um, but it's the largest brownfield site uh, in uh, Greater Cambridge, and it's also in the most sustainable location, as Caroline Hunt has has clarified. We're therefore faced with an issue about: Do we want to uh, um, optimise that in terms of development um, and the brownfield first kind of objectives, uh, or? Um, uh, are there ways in which we might wish to strike a, a different balance? And what the, the approach that we've followed, and it's an approach that follows out from the local plan, is to try and recognise that um, in any respect, this is a there are a series of choices that we have. The site is probably one of the highest density locations that the local plan promotes, if not the highest density location. Um, and that's because, as you've heard, um, it has public transport access uh, both from outside of Cambridge in, but also uh, within Cambridge through the railway stations and so on. Uh, and we've ended up in a situation where we have, um, uh, in response to consultations, reduced the heights and densities. And I've heard Councillor Ripath's comments about um, uh, height uh, not being perhaps an issue, and that's a choice. Um, uh, and we've met in full uh, the open space requirements for informal play and so on. Uh, and you'll have heard Terry's presentation in terms of the actual scale uh, of open space that, that is proposed. But we've recognised that um, using any more of that um, precious brownfield development land for um, things like sports pitches and so on comes with a collateral effect of either greater height and density, which is something that people were very clear about in the last consultation, or the displacement uh, of that growth to greenfield sites. Uh, so we would be we would be effectively utilising and creating uh, more more development in greenfield areas, uh, uh, likely rather than um, uh, utilising this brownfield site. Uh, and so 
the approach that we've tried to follow and the local plan uh, adopts this is to look at things in a slightly more strategic way but to recognize that picking up on a number of commentators points the open space that we are providing isn't incidental or um, small scale but as Terry has highlighted um, there is something around uh, one and a half kilometers long continuous green space um, wider than the width of a football pitch and in most uh, and in a number of parts actually wider than the length of a football pitch as a continuous park where play recreation and indeed much of the paroling um, uh, the the, the the, the walking and so on that potentially takes place in Milton Country Park at the moment because of the absence of that facility um, might well take place in future effectively um, within this site, enjoying the amenities and the um, characteristics of the place. And you know, there are precedents for that um, also in terms of the busyness of some of the, the greatest spaces that we know across cities in the UK and the way that those parks form a really important and powerful space. As Terry has highlighted, some of those spaces, like the main green space, are also substantial areas for informal play and activity. Um, but by necessity, we've had to take a view that meeting that need for the, the not only day to day, but the spaces that are, that are great for health and well-being uh, and usable for health and well-being, we've had to compromise on those areas of formal pitches uh, that um, are in fact quite space hungry. Uh, and um, uh, and are nevertheless necessary as uh, for for formal sport and activity, and it's in that regard that we need to see North East Cambridge uh, as a part of the city of Cambridge and indeed part of the um, hint, the, the Greater Cambridge area as a whole, uh, rather than than in isolation. Of course, there's a direct public transport link to Northstow, for example, from the site, uh, and up, and with GCP up to Water Beach as well, where there are new sports and open space facilities uh, in addition. We've also highlighted that we are looking for innovative forms of delivery, including um, the use of um, uh, 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 rooftops and so on where appropriate for some of those formal sports and activities. And we certainly haven't given up uh, on making the very best use of every part of the, the site. But at a plan level, as opposed to a planning application level, um, uh, along the lines of the concerns that Councillor Bradenham has highlighted, it's very difficult to be precise and specific uh, about um, some of that community provision and the very close detailing of it that, that is normally delivered through Section 106. And what, what, we're, what we have tried to do then is to use the policies in the plan uh, to try and drive, um, drive some of those those choices. Um, I think you've heard enough from me about it, uh, uh, about that point. I would um, commend perhaps uh, some of the questions around cemetery space and um, uh, car parking and so on, uh, but also the relationship with the water treatment works, which Caroline I know has commented on. Um, perhaps if I can pass over to Caroline through you, Chair, um, if that's helpful. Thank you very much, Caroline. Please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I mean, actually, I just wanted to stick with open space for a moment, but thinking about that more strategic open space and the references to Milton Country Park, because um, I think it's important that we see um, how North East Cambridge sits within the wider area and including within the wider proposals emerging through the Greater Cambridge Local Plan. Because if you recall, members, when we brought the, the, the plan through uh, through you a couple of months ago, um, we were looking very much at a lot of work we're doing on green infrastructure across the whole of Greater Cambridge and some significant opportunities for new strategic green spaces um, to come alongside development. And we talked in this area around the role that that uh, opportunity for new uh, North Cambridge uh, strategic open space could have in serving uh, North uh, the North East Cambridge area. So whilst at the moment I, I appreciate you, you know your focus is on Milton Country Park, but I think if you look at it in that wider context, if we are able to deliver on that wider green infrastructure ambition alongside and as part of the new plan, that provides opportunities not only for North East Cambridge to access new facilities, but people who 
currently use Milton Country Park having other opportunities themselves to use that might actually be nearer to where they live and more accessible to them. So I think it's where we start to look at that strategic scale where there are where, where the sort of movements that people make in the facilities that they currently use might change and that overall pressure uh, you, you would hope to see, see, see reduced. And that's very much something we will continue to look at, look at in detail through uh, as we prepare the draft local plan during uh, next year. And I did just want to mention that um, I think Terry probably said in, in the presentation, but just to confirm that we do envisage through the infrastructure um, delivery plan that there would be contributions for off-site um, uh, green infrastructure. It's not specific about that where that would be, so that remains to be discussed and worked through, as I say, through development of the local plan and, and, and as we start to see what that, that picture of open space might look like overall. Um, moving on to talk a little bit around the um, the, the Fen Road issue, um, you know, that is something that we realise members are very concerned about. Members of both um, South Cambridgeshire and also the City Council are very concerned about the impact of the increasing downtime of the level crossing there. And um, only recently, Network Rail came and presented to the North Area Committee, the City Council's North Area Committee, um, uh, uh, on, on their consultation. And members were very clear to them how important uh, this issue is to uh, to the council um, and members. I think we've you know quite successful in securing a commitment from Network Rail to engage with the councils, and that's very much something that we will be picking up uh, as we move into the new year to make sure we are having those discussions with Network Rail about what the potential opportunities could be for dealing with that downtime and what possible opportunities could be. Um, but I think at this point, we genuinely don't know whether a bridge across uh, would be the right solution. There could be other options. Um, and we think that's something that really does need to be owned by Network Rail and, uh, and, and looked at seriously. And we will very much be um, uh, emphasising the significance and importance of that. And we want to work with them as we, as we move forward through the local plan, um, because it may be that the local plan is a good opportunity to address that again, slightly more strategic issue. Um, I think I'm going to hand over to Terry or Matt to talk about one or two of those other issues like around um, faith and, and um, burial facilities and so on. Yeah, I'm happy to pick up some of the issues. In particular, I'll just talk quickly about the um, cemetery space. Uh, so we've had consideration to, to to the requirements for cemetery space through the infrastructure delivery plan. We applied the South Cambridgeshire uh, standards for uh, burial grounds uh, that results in a need for about two hectares of cemetery space to meet the needs of uh, the future burial needs of the site. Uh, we're looking to secure financial contributions to extend uh, existing cemeteries to meet that provision uh, in the future. Uh, with regard to worship space, uh, the AAP promotes multifunctional community spaces, if you like. Those spaces can be used for a range of purposes, including cultural events, but also community meeting spaces as well that could also make provision for worship space as well and, and worship purposes. Um, there was a question regarding affordable workspace uh, and that's actually covered in policy 12B where it requires development proposals to demonstrate how they'll support the delivery of affordable workspace within the within NEC to provide for that uh, drop down workspace for local residents in particular. And there was a question around the station car park um, and the quantum of parking there. Overall, we agree that that quantum uh, that's currently on site is probably in excess of what will be needed. Um, but at the moment, until we get some of the strategic transport infrastructure in place to support a, a move to 
more sustainable modes of accessing the station um, for some of the, the more uh, peripheral users of the station currently. Um, we are stuck with that level of provision. That's the level of provision that Network Rail have suggested is required and needs to be maintained on site. But once we get that sustainable transport measures in place, such as the um, mass transit and, and other initiatives, we could see that level of parking coming down significantly on site. Uh, there was also a question about displacement car parking. Part of the package of the transport strategy for place is to look at uh, how we monitor and manage the trip budget. And that will include monitoring of the surrounding areas, getting a baseline understanding of parking in those areas and monitoring those over time to uh, so that we can uh, pick up if there is being any parking displacement to those areas. And we've got processes in place now uh, where we've got powers devolved from the uh, police to the local authority to introduce controlled parking zones and parking enforcement within those areas should that be necessary to move forward. Theory Thank, you. Stuff you need to pick up. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I think yeah. at that point we're going to come to um, members from other parts of the district who are here in person first of all. So I'm going to come to Dr Richard Williams and then we'll come to uh, those members who are online. So Richard, over to you. Thank, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I've got a number of points to make. I'll start with some general points and then I'll move on to some more specific questions, but I will try to keep it as brief as I possibly can. Um, the, the first general point I wanted to raise is really picking up on issues that a number of members have made indirectly, but some of our public questions earlier made more directly. And that's the fact that, to put it bluntly, I think there are two potentially huge holes that could sink this plan, um, and I think it's premature. The first hole is the DCO, which I think Councillor Hawkins has already acknowledged could mean that we have to come back and look at this again. The second hole is water. Now, the, we're doing this before we've had the water management plan. The document we've got acknowledges the problems that we have with water supply. It only says it thinks there's a reasonable prospect of delivery starting um, in the plan period. But really, until we've got that water management plan, we don't really know. So we've got a document before us that we could have to completely rewrite because of that as well. So I do think this is, this is premature. And we shouldn't really be recommending this for adoption, if, I, if I'm honest, having thought about it since the joint local plan group that I also sat on in, in November, because of these two huge holes in it um, that, you know, as I say, could, could, could require it to be completely um, rewritten. Um, having made that point, the other larger point I wanted to make was about the green spaces. I think Mr Littlewood made an excellent point earlier. I don't think it's reasonable to count green space in the business park as part of green space in this action plan. Uh, I think we all know Milton Road is, is not a road one can easily cross. Um, and I doubt very many residents would, would think of going to a business park um, for you know, recreational green space. I, I do think the green space is inadequate in this. It's very good, and I was very pleased to see that the green space has been increased since the draft plan. That's great. But I would say more, please. Um, I don't think it's adequate. I don't think it's reasonable to count what's on the other side of the road. Um, I mean, on that point, I mean, we were given some figures earlier about, you know, some indicative figures about if we put an extra four hectares of green space, that would be 1,150 fewer homes. I'm afraid my answer to that is great. I think that's good. Um, and I think less dense, more green space, um, because we have to think of the quality of life of the people who live there and not simply about maxing as much as we can possibly cram um, onto um, this site because the green space is not adequate and we all know it will put enormous pressure on Milton Country Park and surrounding um, green areas. It, it, it's inevitable um, and it's common sense. I mean, to the point that if we don't max out the building on this brownfield site, that means we'll have to look at greenfield sites. I would say not really, because we're only planning to build 3,900 homes on this site in the 2021, 2021, 2041 
local plan period. So 4,000 of those houses, we're talking about future demand at some point in some other uh, local plan that we haven't even yet begun to think of. We could quite easily re reduce the density on this site, increase the green space, and have precisely zero impact on the current figures in the current proposed local plan. Who knows what will the case will be in the local plan after the one we're currently processing. We, we might be able to access all sorts of other green spaces. If there's a move to online working, we might need far less office space. Who knows? Um, but I don't think we can use that argument because we're not planning 8,000 homes on this in the, not even the current local plan period, the next local plan period. So there's plenty of space, I think, to, uh, plenty of room to, to, to make an adjustment there and get a slightly different um, balance. On some of my more detailed questions, um, I, I raised this at the joint local plan group, but I, I do just want to come back to the water efficiency uh, measures and, and, and the 80 litres per day, um, which, which in principle I think we all agree with. I mean, it would be wonderful if, if it could be achieved, but, but I would like a bit more detail on this because we talk about making use of, of, of reuse of water, so rainwater harvesting, grey water recycling. I mean, that raises a number of questions. One question is, whose responsibility would it be to maintain the non-potable water supply? Would that responsibility fall on the residents? Because those systems are, you know, not cheap to maintain, and you have to be very careful that you don't mix potable and non-potable water, because non-potable water carries significant health hazards. Now, inevitably, you need a backup system with a non-potable water system, because if it doesn't rain, for example, uh, and the rainwater harvesting goes, you might not have enough water in the, uh, the grey water recycling system or the, or the rainwater harvesting system, that non-potable system, to actually supply what you need to supply to it. So you do need a backup system. There does need to be some interface between the potable and the non-potable um, water. Um, and, and, you know, that is, is a complicated process, and uh, it requires some pretty um, sophisticated maintenance. So who would actually be responsible for ma maintaining that? I mean, I would like to know, I did, again, I asked a similar question, but I would like to know if there are any, you know, empirically tested developments of this size where this level of water consumption has been consistently achieved. I know because it was said in the last meeting, there are certainly schemes where this has been planned, but are there, you know, do we have empirical proof on a similar sort of development that this can actually um, be achieved? I, I have looked, I can't find any, but that may be, uh, you know, because I'm just not looking in the right places. But I would like to know that this is, in fact, um, achievable. Um, just on a few other more specific points. Um, on the biodiversity policy, and this is a very specific policy on policy five. So I'm on page 57 now of um, the, uh, the, the, the plan on the, on the numbers on, on the action plan, not, not, the, um, not the agenda pack numbers, page 57. At the bottom paragraph there, we talk about in exceptional justified circumstances, development proposals that cannot achieve a full 20% biodiversity net gain should seek to provide a higher proportion elsewhere. Um, I was wondering if those shoulds could be musts. Um, we, we, we talked in a different context about the fact that the word should does not mean the same as the word uh, must. I, I would like that to be a more robust policy so that if 20% net gain cannot be achieved, there is a requirement that it should be achieved somewhere else, um, and not that it, uh, or rather it must be achieved somewhere else, getting my own words mixed up, not that it should be, just so that we don't leave any, any doubt about that. So I was wondering if there's room to toughen up that uh, specific um, policy. Um, one other point, and this is a very technical drafting point um, in, in some ways. Um, I'm on page 89. Um, the paragraph uh, there, I think it's the third sentence, it says the councils have undertaken evidence. Um, I'm not sure undertaken evidence is quite written pro properly, undertaken a study or gathered evidence. I'm not sure you can undertake evidence. Um, that's a very um, specific point. Um, and just one other, one, one other final point, and that is just to pick up on something uh, that um, Councillor Bradner mentioned earlier, and that is the, the, the location and the identity of this. I, I strongly support what 
I'm not a local member, but I would strongly support what Councillor Bradham says about this being regarded as part of the city. I know this is slightly outside of the, what is outside of the context of this air action plan, but I think if this does get built, there really is a strong case of redrawing the city boundary. Um, it is slightly ridiculous that of the area we're actually building out here, only the small southeast corner falls in South Cams, and the vast majority of the residential area falls in city. I think it's a bit ridiculous that the people in that southeast corner would be potentially paying different council tax, be represented by a different MP and a different councillor. Um, so I really think if this does happen, we need to redraw the city boundary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, who's next? Oh, councillor Martin Carl. Martin, over to you. Uh, I come to a number of points, really. Uh, coming back to the, the green space area, I mean, that's a, 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 I, I tend to agree that the more informal green space. I, I'm glad to see more green space in the in the um, in the plan. I think that's a, that's a good thing. But basically, it's urban. It's city green space. It's um, it's the sort of place where you you know along one uh, one rugby pitch wider uh, uh, long um, avenue, but between. Uh, tall buildings, to me, it will feel like an urban, a, a, a city green um, space, rather than a rural, uh, sort of more open, more informal green space. And the existing areas around it, as has been commented in Milton Country Park, and also along the, the uh, Cam Towpath, which is the other sort of uh, main avenue going out from that area, potentially an avenue, particularly with a link over the pedestrian link over the railway, are already pretty heavily used um, by people from the city in, in particular. Um, so I think you do need to think about that uh, quite seriously. I mean, one area which doesn't seem to be um, considered, and which in some ways I'm surprised is not even in the uh, in the in the plan uh, thought uh, thinking of the plan, is the area north of the A14, uh, which is the uh, the existing refuse tip area, which has partly been restored and will by the end of this plan no doubt be fully restored. Uh, uh, and our use of that area uh, uh, does need to, I think is an area you need to think about and how you might get ac improved access and more direct access to that area um, in the future. And, uh, it, that obviously is an opportunity which I don't really see has been uh, talked about, no, in the, except in the very broad general sense and that uh, in your long-term thinking. Uh, the other thing that I, which concerns me, and uh, keeps on concerning me, is that you've got a high area, talking about 16,000 people, um, uh, high, uh, densely developed, um, and or hoping, uh, the, the mentality behind this is that it's going to be self-contained. You, you have already an access into Cambridge, which is grossly overloaded. You're, you're worrying about this in terms of how you're going to improve access from Water Beach and not increase access along uh, along the main A10 road. Um, so you, you're now building this development, and, and it, the assumption is that it's not going to increase the traffic into the centre, or it's going to be done by public transport. Well, public transport already is congested there. There's no segregated route into the centre. So the segregated route goes out from there, but not, not into the centre. Uh, uh, and it's not quite obvious at the moment how that's going to take place. Um, you're going to be building this up over a long period of time. Uh, and to get that sort of vibrancy so that it's self-contained, and uh, it's going to... Uh, it's not going to happen at the beginning, so you're going to, the immediate effect is going to be an increase probably of traffic into the centre, which may eventually, as becomes more self-contained, uh, decline. Uh, and so you need to think about how you're going to cope with that intermediate stage um, uh, and how you're going to get people onto public transport and stop um, prevent uh, congestion. The area around uh, Milton Road, that area, particularly by the entrance of the Science Park, gets grossly over, um, congested already. Um, it's, uh, and I'd want to see how that could be uh, facilitated. It's, it's something that worries me, um, that, that, that can you really make it sufficiently self-contained and attractive that people don't go to the centre? There will be, I'm sure, a certain amount of attractiveness to the centre because that's where most of the activities currently take place. Um, you're going to have to somehow reduce, um, reduce that magnetism. Um, well, uh, I'm, uh, I think it's a very desirable aim, but I'm, 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 I have my... It, reservations whether it can be achieved um, and whether it can be achieved certainly over the earlier stages of the plan the plan plan development uh, so um, so uh, and the fen road which everybody's commented about uh, anybody who's been there sees that 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 as a problem um, uh, it's uh, uh, it's not just for the uh, it's not just for tra car traffic it is pedestrians in particular seeing uh, kids coming back from school and crossing that uh, trying 
level crossing, seeing if they can cross quickly, you know, behind the behind the gates. It's a problem. If, you, if it's closed that proportion of the time, people are going to be tempted to cross it unsafely. Uh, 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 and uh, I think it's a, an accident there waiting to happen. Uh, so those, those are the key points I wanted to get across. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, we now come to Councillor Nigel Cathcart. Thank you very much, yes. Uh, I, this, this has been on the table for the 30 odd years I've been on the, on the council. I remember in 1990, um, being given a, a considerable airing. Um, and I've, I've listened to the debate, and, and certainly uh, it seems that many of the points are very valid and, and, and legitimate have been made and, and quite serious and substantial. Don't really undermine the essential suitability of the site for development that's been on the table for so long. Um, uh, ju just a couple of points. The, um, it, it seems that this, and I think this has been alluded to already, that what speed put forward is a skillful uh, marriage, if you like, of urban uh, and intense uh, development of some form, and a more relaxed rural development. In fact, so it seems to put those two together in a way which actually has a reasonable degree of harmony. And I feel like roof gardens and talk about that at the at the more um, uh, spacious uh, open space that's also on the table. So. There's quite a lot of skill and focus got into this, quite obviously. Uh, just returning to that, the only the last point, we just returning this question of water, um, which really it shares the same issue with local plans, which we are under consideration. Um, and, Nigel, uh, could I just interrupt a moment? Could I, I you, think, could you, the, the Ma Nigel, could sorry. you put your microphone a little bit closer to you, please? It's it's not very is, clear at this end. Is that any better? Yes, please. Thank you. Yes, all right. Um, and, yeah, all right. Uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the water um, issue has been alluded to already, but clearly I think the, it needs to be brought in mind the open space, that, especially if we're moving into an area of drier and uh, hotter summers. The maintenance, especially a newly established open space, trees, hedgerows, grass, needs an enormous amount of water in order to make sure that they are effective for the long term. Um, and also, um, we need to put in the strategic measures in place. I was slightly disturbed looking at the report. It talks about, um, uh, well, if the, uh, the new reservoir was pretty much in place, then uh, we need to make sure that the planning and application is accompanied by ways to solve the water pump. Whereas, of course, um, water is such an important issue, it needs to be handled strategically long before we get to the detailed application stage. Um, uh, and I'm sure that all this will be put in mind. But, I mean, any only major point. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Are there any other speakers left? Um, I have, n I have, n sorry? Anna, is it brief and is it, it's going to be different to something that we've logged so far? Just one point. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, just two points. One is that um, the Cambridge Science Park currently is used for recreation. A lot of people run around the Science Park and also dog walk around the Science Park because it's laid out with a lot of green space in it, although that is likely to be densified, so it may be lost. Um, the other one is about Fen Road level crossing. And I just wanted to clarify the Councillor so Timmy Hawkins is right to refer to the Ely Area Capacity Study because this was doing an assessment of the capacity of the line because, of course, they want to increase both the number and frequency of trains on the line. So in future, that it is very likely that the downtime at those gates will be extended, not least also because a third factor, trains will be longer going up the line. We currently, well, for a long time, we've only had uh, is it six carriage trains or four, four carriage, wait, four carriage trains. We've recently had an extension at Water Beach Railway Station, which has enabled eight carriage trains to uh, stop there. But actually, the potential for the future when Water Beach Newtown is built out and we have a new relocated railway station will be for 12 carriage trains. So these three factors will increase the downtime at the level crossing. And, and that is what I'm concerned about. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Bradnam. Uh, Councillor Hawkins, did, do you want to come back on those final points? 
Um, I would, I'm intending mm -hmm. that um, between Ian Senior and I, we will um, put together a whole series of recommendations which we would like uh, to go to Cabinet and for Cabinet to consider in due course. Um, so we'll, we'll get that done in the next couple of days. Uh, but if there was something you wish to add on those final points that have been made, please feel free to do so. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, uh, yes, I would. Um, I do understand the concern um, that Councillor Bradnam um, is emphasising. And again, you know, adding any more vehicular traffic to um, the North East Cambridge will completely change the requirements of the trip budget that we have. And the problem that's caused by network rail is outside of the AAP area, but we are aware of the requirements and we do have um, contact with network rail um, and officers. And from the last uh, briefing or the meeting that we had, which I think you were at, um, the network rail officers made some comments which we will be following up um, over the next few weeks. Um, just to touch on um, Councillor Dr. Richard Williams' point about prematurity, um, I think we did say earlier on that the AAP is being prepared now, um, but it's not for adoption at this stage. We have to wait until the DCO process is complete. But the AAP has to be created now in order to support the DCO process itself. Um, that this AAP will form an evidence base at the DCO um, hearings to show that the NEC can actually be delivered if the, um, uh, the examiners were minded to um, allow the relocation to take place. So it's not premature, not in that respect. Uh, on the water issue, yes, water is a big issue. We have um, very clearly stated in the first proposals that um, it is a deal breaker. But what we cannot do is to hold off doing our local plans. We have government saying to us, you have to create your local plans. You have to move on and do this. So we cannot afford uh, not to create the plans. If we then have to pause it, then we will do so if the solutions for water do not come forward as it should. It's not down to us to provide the solution, but we are working with Anglia Water, as we have said, and we will be taking into account the timelines um, that, they, that they are giving us in terms of actually providing the solution to the water issue. Um, I will defer perhaps to uh, Terry regarding any examples um, that can provide empirical formula. I'm not sure about that. Um, you mentioned toughening up the, um, uh, the wording on where biodiversity is um, implemented on the site. We do have a cascade uh, process, which is on the site, wherever it is being built, or near the site, and then as a last uh, result, off-site. And what I'm hoping is that the area of green infrastructure that we are providing between, um, on the sort of north, East across the A14 would one of those areas where, as a last resort, um, biodiversity could be provided. So there is this cascade. If you say must for the second step, then you can't go further, can you? So we are carefully, we are carefully considering those wordings. Noted. Um, I don't know about the governance issues regarding drawing the uh, boundary redrawing the brand. I mean, that's something we'll have to look at at the time when it, when it does it, but we do note that. Thank you. Um, on the intermediate issues on traffic, perhaps I could refer that to Matt uh, or whoever else is um, able to solve or provide answers to that. Thank you very much, Chairman, and thank you all for your comments and your um, questions. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Hawkins and members. Thank, thank you all very much indeed. Councillor Daunton, did you want to come back briefly? And then I'm going to come to Councillor Ripper. Yes. Yes, I'm going to come back to the There is a reference um, to 
um, on page 225 uh, of the document, 254 of our agenda. Um, evidence supporting this policy, community and cultural facilities audit provision, cultural placemaking strategy, Greater Cambridge creative business and cultural production workshops, workspace study. I don't see much in the document about cultural spaces or about culture in general. Um, I do see quite a lot about community facilities and community spaces. Where are we going to be able to have concerts, recitals, plays? Um, are, are the community facilities going to be serving faith space, um, craft workshops? Are we going to be trying to get too much out of these community facilities? Where, where is culture? We've talked a lot about green spaces. That's, I'm, I'm very much in support of that. We've talked a lot about sports facilities. We haven't talked about culture. Thank you, Claire. I'll, 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 add, I'll add that to the list. I'm going to come now to Councillor Wycliffe. Thank you, Chair. Um, there's one or two points I just wanted to really make particularly clear because I thought maybe I hadn't been clear initially. Um, I understand that network rail is obviously not part of our own process here, but I feel so, so strongly about that bridge. Um, and it's just a certain irony that Chesterton Fen and the traveller site there, the two things they haven't got is main sewage, where we've got currently a sewage plant down the road, um, and they haven't got a bridge, and yet Network Rail is wishing to close level crossings because they are dangerous. I, I know that's probably naughty of me to bring that up here, but I feel very, very passionately about it. Um, as regards the green space, um, I'm, I'm sure planning is aware that there's um, very usable site just in north of Milton where there have been planning applications previously which have um, not come to anything and the Sports Lake Trust have been interested in using that space for extra water sports facilities and indeed you know walking um, area um, so there needs to be some drilling down on this I think you know section 106 I know it's very difficult in an area of action plan to do but it's just something that really would be an opportunity and I think an opportunity not to be missed and just finally my point on heights I said that it was very unpopular and I kind of put myself out there by saying well designed tall buildings can be good um, I don't like urban sprawl I think if you're going to do an urbanized area you know don't sort of not really attain that and you know design something that's good it doesn't have to be a ton of tower blocks um it's just the image that people have in their minds i think often and that does create more space and be careful with the lighting and how that's designed i just don't think it's actually unattainable um to do something good without sort of not using that land you know to the best advantage that you can and I also thought what Councillor Khan made a really good point about the landfill site. There will come a time, hopefully not too distant future, when that is not sort of um, like a banned piece of green space and that could be, you know, developed. It won't be a landfill site forever. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Judith and um, Councillors. I think. Um, We've spent uh, over two hours on this. I think we've really uh, gone into it in a very deep way. We will put um, some recommendations to go forward to Cabinet in due course. But could I thank you all for your input on this very important matter. And uh, with that, we can now move on to item seven on the agenda, which is the Housing Revenue Account Asset Management Strategy which starts on page 317 of your document pack. Oh, I will invite, uh, I believe, Councillor Bachelor is going to introduce it for us. John. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'm desperately hoping that this uh, is not a con contentious uh, issue. Um, 
it's a, a straightforward uh, business plan. Really. We all share your hope, I can assure you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. So this is about building strong foundations um, for the, the business of our housing stock. Um, I'll be brief. Uh, let's just uh, get some context here. We've got over five and a half thousand houses currently with more than 10,000 tenants. Um, in the open market, this is an asset base of something of the order of 1.4 billion pounds. This is a big business. And this strategy is about uh, managing that over the medium and longer term, five to 30 years. It's about an investment of something in the order of 450 million pounds in maintaining our stock, improving it and bringing it all up to a, um, a, a zero carbon standard uh, before 2050. Um, put this into context again, um, it's interesting to note that for the first time we are now starting to add to our housing stock. Uh, back in the 1980s we had more than 9,000 houses, um, with, but with the uh, introduction of the right to buy we've lost something of the order of four and a half thousand over the years as they steadily declined in the number of our stock. That is now starting to change. Last financial year we managed to add 34 houses. Um, in this financial year we're looking to do about 87 houses and much more in the coming years. So that's all I want to say as by way of introduction. Um, I know that Peter Campbell has a brief presentation up his sleeve if you would like to see that, um, Chair. Members, would you like to see the presentation? Yes, please. <laughs> right. Peter. I'll try and share my screen. Give me a second, please. Are you seeing that? We can indeed. Okay, then. If you could go to slide uh, show mode, we could see all of it. There you are. Thank you very much for the prompt. Excellent. So, yes, yeah, so as uh, John's uh, um, stolen my thunder a bit, this is the HRA Asset Management Strategy, which is a, a really important document um, uh, for, the, for the housing service. So what's it all about? What's in the metrics? As John said, we've got nearly five and a half thousand properties and they're growing. We are now building more, more than we're selling. We've got a value of 1.4 billion open market value, and that is growing both as increasing numbers and increasing value. And of course, we're one of the major housing providers uh, in the area. This isn't just about asset. This is about providing homes for people. So an asset management in our approach is more than just a getting the best from the assets. And what the strategy is trying to do is to look at the context. It's look more than just at what we're doing, but looking explaining why we're doing things. We're very clearly placing the customers front and centre in everything that we do. We recognise that by retaining the council housing stock, we've got an ability to have you know, significantly more influence over um, uh, over people uh, and over our communities uh, than do organisations who've uh, either councils who've got rid of the housing stock or housing associations who aren't rooted within the communities. And of course, what's important to me is that we're striving to the best. We're not complacent. We want to improve year, year on year. And in doing this, we've come up with you know, what's important to us in providing the service. We want um, um, to, it's more than bricks and mortars. It's about creating places where people feel safe and communities thrive. And we've got the values, supportive, accountable, customer focused, professional staff with high quality, energy efficient homes. 
the drivers behind this is that we don't live in a, a operating in isolation. We are part of a, a, a wider society, the wider housing industry, and we recognise their influences outside uh, the organisation, um, such as HRA reform, self-financing, the reform of social housing, the new charter of social housing residents, you know, arising from uh, uh, the fallout from Grenfell, where we've got to uh, provide more demonstrable safety uh, to our customers. The increase in Homes England in, in, in place shaping. The decent home standards and the, uh, and the, promising, the promised future home standards, uh, driving up standards uh, in, in the, uh, for social housing, and of course the Homes Fitness and Human Habitations Act, all legislation which has helped to shape this, uh, uh, this new strategy. The strategy itself, the first few pages, contain lots of background uh, data. To me, that's really important. It's about setting the scene, it's about setting the context, and it's an uh, illustration that we're um, uh, adopting an approach where decision making is based on, uh, on, on facts. We want to improve our intelligence to, to allow us to make uh, better decisions, and very clearly involving customers in, in delivering their and our priorities. We've got an overall strategic uh, priority provide good quality, sustainable homes that are affordable to live in and where people choose to live. But behind that, we've got about a, a, a dozen uh, 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 other priorities. I'm only going to go a few of those. The first one and the most important is ensuring the homes we provide are safe and secure and meet and exceed all statutory safety standards. Absolutely essential. The fallout of Grenfell has, has um, shown us what happens when people uh, don't listen. And you know, across the country, um, housing organisations who don't manage safety properly are the ones that get into trouble. The ones who don't carry out the safety test, don't carry out the fire risk assessments. We're going to make sure that we're absolutely perfect in doing this. Priority B to have in place well-designed repairs and maintenance systems to ensure homes are well-maintained and kept in a good state of repair. Of course, the big one. We make, we've got. Uh, five and a half thousand properties, we maintain and look after them well. We're currently out to tender for repair service and that will um, uh, influence uh, uh, the, the provision over the next uh, you know, up to 15 years of the contract course well. And the final one I want to cover here is you know, the, the importance of having a long term uh, programme to improve the thermal efficiency, to make the houses greener. Uh, with the aim of being carbon neutral by, by 2050. And that's a combination. Uh, the initial years, we're going to spend on reducing uh, energy usage uh, in the properties. Uh, and then we're going to, we are in the process of testing out technology. So in, we're involved in several national schemes where rather than just take the salesman spiel, we, te we, we take um, take the kit, fit it in our properties, and say it survives contact with, with, with real life. So we're, we're actually building real examples um, uh, and working with our tenants uh, to, to, uh, to make the houses more and more green uh, as we go forward. Uh, and recognising that you know, this may include some education for people as well. You know, the, the, uh, I've been struck recently, the, the contrast between um, wanting to make properties um, airtight to make them more energy efficiency and need having, needing to have um, properties that you can ventilate to get, to get rid of the uh, coronavirus. So that sort of challenge moving forward. So what next? So this is a, a, a substantial piece of work. It's uh, a, a, it taken a long time uh, to get to this. And hope it, what it shows is our commitment to um, have a strong approach to asset management uh, and our strive to be the best. We want to make sure that we've got um, uh, strong data to allow us to make informed decisions. So there's a, um, you'll see there's a lot of actions there about care and stock condition survey, uh, in, um, involving tenants in uh, setting standards, can get a tenant survey, et cetera. It's about, we're going to be setting targets and monitoring progress towards those targets. And we're setting up groups with um, uh, joint groups with officers, uh, tenants and members to do that. 
to make sure that we've got um, a very clear uh, methods of communication, that there's no surprises for, for members or customers, develop our long-term um, plans, um, set our standards and monitor standards towards that. And as I said, uh, it's about uh, uh, all stakeholders working uh, closely together. But also, this is not a, uh, no way, a document that we're going to um, uh, be leaving uh, st um, that on a shelf. It's one that we're going to be acting on and, and uh, monitoring its progress. And almost as soon as it's signed up, we're going to start work on, on, on the action plan and working towards the next iteration. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter. I have a request, first of all, from Councillor Peter Fain. So I'll come back to you shortly. So, Peter. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I recognise that, as John Batchelor said, we are just trying to make up for the um, massive reduction in council housing that has been suffered over a period under the right to buy. Um, and there is a limit to the extent we were only able to add small numbers to the total as compared with the, the vast numbers that have been lost. And so we have to take, in my view, a very um, flexible approach to the various avenues for meeting that need. Um, and we have to look beyond our current stock. Obviously, this is about asset management. Uh, it's not about our overall housing policy as such. But we have to find ways of meeting the unmet needs, those needs which are not met by the market. Um, what we refer to in uh, our business plan, as set out on uh, Para 26, page 324, truly, truly affordable housing because we must recognise that even when we do achieve the the 40% on new developments, um, and that may be affected by viability, those houses are not truly affordable because of the general house price in this area to many of the people who need them. So I think we need to recognise that we have to extend this policy as set out here by looking, for instance, at rural exception sites, recognising that will be few new homes, whether council or market houses, in our smaller communities, and that may make it very difficult for them to maintain viability and sustainability of those communities. Sustainability, obviously, in social and economic as well as environmental terms. Um, so that's one gap we will have difficulty filling. Clearly, our own stock is now being supplemented, as you expect me to say. I mentioned earlier I'm a director of Home and Street and uh, Shire Homes, as of course is is Peter, Peter Campbell. Um, and I think there's a very valuable role in being able to take on houses and rent them out to those who need them um, without necessarily having to own those homes ourselves. I think we also need to look at priority F which is set out on page 320, and consider where we can acquiring both land and existing houses um, to increase the number of council-owned properties. Um, and in some cases, we should consider there may be a good case for buying back the equity share in part owned homes um, where that provides good value for money. This council took a decision in 2005 not to do that anymore. I think in some cases we may be missing opportunities to meet the needs of our residents by our decision not to buy back the equity share, which could offer very much better value for money than seeking to build new and so on. Um, so I think we need to recognise in this document that whilst managing our existing assets and expanding our existi existing assets is important, we have to make take a flexible approach and look at other avenues alongside that. And I'm not quite sure that that is currently sufficiently reflected in this document. 
Peter, thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm going to go to the uh, remote members first, and I'll come back to the ladies, if I may. So, so we have Councillor Henry Batchelor. Thank you, Chair. Nothing particularly exciting for me, other than the fact I realised I should probably have declared an interest at the start of the meeting, uh, in that I am um, South Camps' board member on the two investment partnerships. Um, they are mentioned at various points throughout the, uh, the appendices as being a potential supplier of housing. So I thought it was better that I just declare that interest now, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Henry. Claire, over to you. Um, thank you very much for... Oh, gosh, it's quite an echo. Um, no, that's not echoing now. Um, thank you very much for the document. I think it's a really good document. Um, I got two comments, um, or questions really. Um, one is that um, in order to put this into practice, as you said, um, both John and Peter, um, it needs a professional staff, or we already have good professional staff. Will we need more staff um, to put this um, asset management strategy into practice? Um, and uh, will we be able to um, afford those professional staff? Um, and then secondly, um, I, I might have missed it, but I don't see it, um, any concentration here on the estate, the, the land and the surrounding area in which our houses sit. And I think it's really important that we maintain not only the built stock, but the, the, the surrounding areas, the, the, the green stock, so to speak, the, the um, the estate in general, so that we can really be proud of the location for our council houses. Peter, would you like to come back on those two points that, from Peter and from yes. Um Yes. Yes. First of all, the council of Fay. Um, this uh, this um, uh, strategy is specifically about um, the um, the asset management. Uh, within the, within the HRA, um, yes, I agree. There are um, uh, the, the, uh, Ermine Street and Shire Homes play uh, a, a an important and distinct role uh, for the council, uh, but th they're operating under a, a, a different regime uh, and, and different finances. And I think it's more appropriate that they develop their own um, asset management strategies, which which may be largely reflective of this document but should be distinct nevertheless. Uh, and then particularly in the case of Ermine Street being uh, an independent, uh, a, a, a company, albeit a council-owned company. Um, I do agree um, that the council needs to look at um, abilities to, to, to grow and flex, uh, and we need to make sure that they, um, that they deliver uh, value for money. Uh, and bearing in mind, um, the, the recent changes um, to the right to buy uh, receipts for, for um, uh, local authorities make it much more difficult to purchase any prop any existing properties using re using right to buy receipts. So we we, we need to make the best of the, mo the money that, that that we've got to buy the most appropriate properties um, um, where there's a demand. Uh, going um, to, on to the second point. Um, I, I, we will have, uh, we do have a, a, a very fantastic um, uh, team, uh, team of staff. Uh, I think we're, we're sufficient. There are times when we're going to have to buy services in. So if we're doing a stock condition survey, um, I think that, that, that needs to be, um, that's a service that we'll have to buy and try to do it, do it ourselves. But I'm confident on the uh, on the normal running co uh, you know, the running of the services. After that, um, we, we can do that ourselves. If we find differently, um, when we analyse the uh, uh, the results of the uh, stock condition survey, that of course will be subject to a um, a, a separate report. Um, with regards to the uh, regards to the estate, um, I, I agree entirely. We have tried to cover that, albeit um, in rather less detail within the strategy, uh, on pages about 63 to 65, I think they are, towards the end of the document. We've not gone into a great deal of detail there, 
but we certainly recognise that our assets are very much you know, are um, much more than just the houses. Thank you very much, Peter. I think I have two more speakers: Councillor Bradman and then Councillor Richard Williams. Could I suggest that Councillor Richard Williams goes first? Uh, uh, Councillor Williams. Councillor Bradman has deferred to you. Well, that's very kind, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Bradman. lucky day. I'd just say to Councillor Batchelor as well, I'm not taking your, uh, your point at the start about this not being controversial as a challenge or anything. So, um, so, so anyway, I, I just said, uh, just first of all, to say, actually, I think the document was really well put together. So, so thank you for that. I, I thought it was, it, it was a really well um, constructed document. Um, the questions I had are not entirely directly from this, but, but they are related. Um, on planning committee, we've had a steady stream over the last year of applications coming from the council looking for outline planning permission um, for areas that we own, um, usually their garages, for you know, self-built houses, which, which presumably are to be sold off privately. I, I kind of had two questions, really. One, where does the money go if those sites are sold off? Is that money that can be ploughed back into the housing revenue account and, you know, put towards buying other council houses. But my second question is actually would be my preference, which is instead of us selling off these sites to private, um, for private development, um, which is what seems to be happening, it would be much better if we were building new council houses on them ourselves. Um, I can't really make that point on planning committee because it's not a material consideration. Um, but I did want to make that point here. Thank you. I can answer that one. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, please do, please. Uh, yeah, uh, you're entirely right. Um, the the idea is that when we sell um, plots off, uh, we're getting uh, you know, rid of land. Uh, we you know, create a receipt which is used used within, within the HRA. Um, we have um, we're currently reviewing those sites uh, with the view of of making them more uh, retaining more of them ourselves for for, for our own uh, for our own development. Uh, um, realistically, if, a, uh, if a, a plot is only big enough for one or two properties, um, usually the overheads make it um, uh, unaffordable for us to build the, um, the, the odd council property there, unless we can cluster several sites together and work, uh, and work uh, treat them almost, almost as one site. Um, we're, we're in the process at the moment with a new build team uh, and with the repairs team, just going through that and see if we can rationalise rationalize that stock with you of bringing a paper to members in the coming months. Thank you, Peter. And now I come to Councillor Bratton. Thank you, Chair. Um, and the reason I wanted to uh, go last is because I have a good news story for you. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to commend this uh, Absolutely, it's an excellent report and very accessible, so thank you very much for that. Um, and I commend the vision to be customer focused and supportive, which we can see on page eight. Um, on page 29, we see a wish to achieve tenant satisfaction. And on page 34, we, we see this um, identification of priority A, to ensure that our housing stock provides homes that are safe and secure and that we meet or exceed all statutory safety standards. And Mr. Campbell has explained exactly the practicality of that. But I also wanted to commend our council because what is embodied in this report is not just a commitment to the bricks and mortar, but as Mr. Campbell said, it's to the health and happiness of our tenants in those homes. And the reason I wanted to talk about that is because that whole culture comes from our leadership but also from our staff and and i wanted to commend the housing team for their approach to this and i can give you one uh, particular example which i will keep anonymous um, where a couple contacted me because they were frightened in their uh, housing which was not through our tenancy uh, it was not uh, district council housing. They were frightened. Um, they had a nice uh, flat and they had spent an inordinate amount of time and effort to make it a nice um, development. 
They had moved there because they had been terrorized elsewhere. They were then terrorized again in this new flat. And I got in contact with the housing team. And I, well, no, firstly, I got in contact with their landlord who, and I even had, I had long communications with them. I had face-to-face -face meetings with them when you could do such things. And they didn't listen and they didn't do anything about the concerns this couple felt threatened in that locality. <clears throat> so I went to the South Cairns team and they suggested ways that they might be able to help. They suggested ways that that couple could um, seek for alternative accommodation on Homelink and they assisted them. We had to wait quite a long time until stock became available. But that couple are now housed in a completely different locality. The, the, the home that they are in is smaller than their flat, but they're happy there because we are a better landlord than their previous landlord. We are a kind landlord and we have made it possible for them to be there and to be safe in the broadest sense of the word. They feel safe in the community that they are now in. And I was very happy to be able to go and visit that couple and just on an ad hoc basis, and I dropped in and said, is it all right if I come and visit you? And they were delighted to see me and said how pleased they were to be in the ne their new location. So I just wanted to thank the housing team. And this document embodies that safety, you know, in the broadest sense, not just in the bricks and mortar. And I wanted to thank our team for that. Thank you, Chair. Lovely story, Councillor Bradnam. Thank you very much for doing that. Um, we do have one more speaker. I'm sorry to say you weren't last. You didn't get the last word this time. Uh, Councillor Bear Park, my apologies. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, I just want to repeat a, um, a comment I made at the Climate Change and uh, Environment um, Advisory Committee, uh, which when we would discuss the net zero ambitions of, the, uh, of this. Um, and I mentioned um, that uh, the energy price cap has already risen. Um, it's likely to go up a lot more next year. Um, and it's going to hit a lot of people very hard. Um, and I appreciate it's difficult to identify necessarily people who are likely to be in uh, fuel poverty, um, but wondered whether um, it might be possible to prioritize how uh, insulating homes uh, may be done, uh, particularly because we don't know how long these high energy prices are likely to persist. Um, so I appreciate maybe a short term issue, but I think possibly it's likely to be a long term issue and whether there's anything we can do to to help those most in need, basically. Thank you, Councillor Bear Park. I think it's a bit like fish and chips, really. The price goes up and never, never seem to come down. Can you address um, that, please, Chair? Um, it's relatively easy. We have got, um, we're just working on two ports at the moment to do exactly that, uh, to do uh, money advice uh, and uh, energy advice um, to both tenants and people who are um, not our tenants who are, risk at, uh, are at risk at losing their homes. So that will be one service. Um, the second thing that, that we're doing is um, more long term, is, is recognising that uh, when we do the uh, stock condition survey, we're going to have a, a, a the survey designed to meet our specific needs. So rather than just the, the bog standard one that you buy, for, buy from a contractor, we're having a specific focus uh, on energy efficiency measures in order to uh, use the information to, to to better come up with a a, a longer term um, you know fabric first building response plan um, so, so, so we've got a, we, we've got a clear pathway uh, a pathway forward so although that you know we can't <laughs> obviously do the, the energy prices we're responding as quickly as we can okay thank, thank you, thank you very much peter we have a final speaker councillor cathcart nigel You're mute, Nigel. Nigel, you are mute. Nigel, if you are talking to us, we cannot hear you. Oh, is he? Okay.
Nigel, are you talking to us? We cannot hear you. No. Nigel, can you read the text? No, I think Nigel cannot hear us. We cannot hear him. So I think we will have to move on. Um, so can I thank you all for your comments? Um, I think as uh, councillors Bradham and Dawn have both said, an excellent report. And um, we'll pass on the additional comments that have come from the discussion this evening. And we can now move on to item nine on the agenda, which is the work programme. Uh, could I just invite members to take note of that? And I would just add that I have asked for that very early in the new year, perhaps um, as early as the January meeting, uh, that we will have an update on the uh, 3CIT um, status. Uh, it seems to me that it's been going much better than it had in the past, um, but it would be nice to hear that confirmed uh, in a report to the scrutiny committee. If there are no questions on the work programme, could I invite you to take note of the date of the next meeting? You will be relieved to know that he's not now going to be on Monday evening because we have concluded our business today and it will therefore be on Tuesday the 18th of January 2022 starting at 5.20pm. And with that, councillors, can I thank you all very much for your contributions this evening. I think we've done some very, very sound work and we have some excellent recommendations which we can take forward to Cabinet. And may I wish you all a very, very Merry Christmas and a happy, safe, healthy and prosperous New Year in 2022. And let's hope it's better than this one. Thank you all and good night. Mr Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Well, I think we have Sorry, can you hear me now? from Councillor Cathcart. I'm so, I'm sorry. There was a uh, just a technical breakdown in my system. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you, Nigel. But I've closed I'm the sorry, meeting. Sorry, I, I my my uh, my system failed. No, I just very, very brief on, on the housing issue. Just wanted to uh, say I think it's an excellent document. Um, uh, it's something we should have had many, many years ago, uh, and it's um, uh, it's well worth doing. 